Now, a hearing on the presidential transition. Today, a House subcommittee looked at the Presidential Transition Act of 1963 and the effect of the current delay on the incoming administration. You'll hear from a number of witnesses, including former staff members from past presidential administrations. Congressman Steve Horn chairs this subcommittee on government management, information, and technology. It's about four hours and 20 minutes. to order. These are extraordinary times in American history that there is a need for this hearing is equally extraordinary and disturbing. In October 12th of this year, the President signed into law the Presidential Transition Act of 2000, which I happen to have introduced in the House. Regardless of which candidate would be the next President, the 106th Congress wanted to give him greater assistance in assuming the highest office in the land. No one, however, anticipated the closeness of this race for the presidency or the unsettling events that have followed. The Presidential Transition Act, as amended, authorizes funding for the General Services Administration to provide suitable office space, staff compensation, and other costs associated with the transition process. The Act also calls for the Administrator of the General Services Administration to ascertain the, quote, apparent successful candidates for the Office of President and Vice President. The Administrator, of course, does not determine the winners. That responsibility is set in the Constitution, clearly belongs to the Electoral College, and failing that, Congress. Obviously, the presidential transition period must begin well before Congress meets to tally the Electoral College votes in January. The brief transition period from the day after election to the day of inauguration is the time in which an incoming president makes crucial administrative decisions. That time is running out for the next administration. Indeed, the 88th Congress clearly recognized the importance of the transition period by stating in the 1963 law that, quote, any disruption occasioned by the transfer of the executive power could produce results detrimental to the safety and well-being of the United States and its people. Yet today, nearly four weeks after the presidential election, the administrator says he's still unable to ascertain a winner and thus it is not providing the appropriate assistance required by the Presidential Transition Act. We've called this hearing to examine whether the Presidential Transition Act provides sufficient guidance to the administrator on how to proceed when an election such as this is disputed. Clearly the law allows the administrator certain discretion in complying with its provisions. It is imperative, however, that those charged with implementing this law most carefully consider the implications of their decisions and the precedents they establish. Our ultimate concern is to ensure the strength and continuity of the United States government, most especially in extraordinary times such as these. We've assembled a distinguished panel of witnesses today. I welcome all of you and look forward to your testimony. We will now have opening statements uh, uh, limited to five minutes at the most. And uh, I start with the ranking uh, member, uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's clear to all of us that the orderly transition from one presidential administration to another is a matter of utmost important to, importance to the country. In order to facilitate this transition, the Congress passed the Presidential Transition Act of 1963, which provides funding and guidance in order to promote the orderly transfer of power from one administration to the next. Prior to 1963, there was no formal provision to assist in the transition period. Under the Act, the General Services Administration shall provide fully equipped headquarters and a variety of services for the President-elect's transition and inaugural teams. 
The act calls for the administrator of the GSA to release federal funds for transition once he or she has, in the words of the act, ascertained the apparent successful candidate. We know that the unique ongoing circumstances of the presidential election of 2000 are unprecedented for purposes of the act. Additionally, there is no precedent or nor does the statute provide uh, guidance for the administrator in ascertaining the apparent successful candidate. The legislative history derived from the discussion of the original act on the floor of the House in 1963 provides perhaps our best evidence of the intent of the Congress. Mr. Fossil of Florida, the then manager of the bill, in response to questions regarding how the administrator of GSA would ascertain the apparent successful candidate in a situation where the election outcome is in question stated, and I quote, if the administrator had any question in mind, he simply would not make any designation in order to make the services available as provided by the act. If, as an intelligent human being, and he has a doubt, he would not act until a decision has been made in the Electoral College or in the Congress. We know that the outcome of this election remains in doubt due to the, due the fact that both campaigns have brought forward legal cases that are currently pending in both state and federal courts. I fully appreciate the need for our next president-elect to begin a comprehensive transition to ensure that government operations continue running smoothly. Yet we should not allow haste to distort our view or our implementation of the Presidential Transition Act. If the administrator, administrator of GSA were to incorrectly release funds to one campaign under the act, aside from breaking the law, it could result in a loss of public funds, waste, duplication, diminished credibility for the winner, and a breach of proprietary information. I'm pleased to learn that the administrator of GSA has, in the interim, during this period of uncertainty, attempted to work with both campaigns to shorten the turnover time once a winner has been finally determined. And I commend uh, the administrator for their efforts in these difficult circumstances. I think our hearing today provides us with a unique opportunity to review the law governing presidential transitions. If there is one lesson that we can learn from the 100 million votes cast almost four weeks ago, it is that our two parties have a mandate to work together. I sincerely hope that today's hearing can be an opportunity for us to set an example of bipartisan cooperation that will be most certainly needed in the next Congress as a result of the closeness of this presidential contest. Our ability to govern in the interest of the American people will depend upon uh, our success in this endeavor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to hearing from all of the distinguished witnesses that we have here today. Well, I thank the gentleman. Uh, he is a good example of the bipartisan cooperation we've had on this committee for the last six years. I now yield to the vice chairman of the committee, Ms. Biggert, the distinguished uh, lady in, from Illinois. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this oversight hearing on the Presidential Transition Act of 1963. Given the unique and unprecedented situation in which our country finds itself today uh, during this presidential election year, this hearing is not only timely, but it is warranted and necessary. Almost a month has passed since men and women across this great nation and overseas cast their ballots for the candidate they hoped the next day would be the president-elect. Well, here we are today, and still the keys to the transition offices and the funding that goes along with them have not been turned over to the successful candidate. And I don't think it, it's not because there has been no successful candidate. It's because the candidate's success is being disputed, contested, and litigated by the unsuccessful candidate. So as the litigation marches on in these few days uh, remaining before the electors are seated and the final disposition made, I think the question we must ask, ask is how can we help? Not more than two months ago, we on this subcommittee hailed passage of the Presidential Transition Act of 2000, 
We asserted that our bill would make it easier for the next administration to assume office, but what happened? We did pass a good bill, but good bills like good intentions aren't always enough. What this subcommittee did not foresee was this year's tight election could make our efforts moot, at least as they apply to this election cycle. And what we also did not take into account is how easily politics and political considerations can overtake common sense and the common good. It is no secret that the success or failure of a new administration, at least for the first year of governing, often depends on how well the trans transition process is carried out. As some of our witnesses today have seen firsthand, it takes time, in some instances a lot of time, to put the thousands of people policies and procedures into place for a successful governance. Uh, four weeks have come and gone, and January 20, 20, 2001 is less than eight weeks away. One third of the precious time allocated for transition has expired, and yet no individual has been afforded the assistance provided for by the tra Presidential Transition Act. This assistance is needed, as the 1963 Act stated, to promote the orderly transfer, transfer of executive power. Is this the fault of General Services Administration, the agency responsible for helping new administrations get up to speed? Is the GSA playing favorites or showing partisanship by now allowing the Bush-Cheney team to access the office space and systems that have been set up for transition purposes? The GSA will state that it was unable to release the funding because the election is too close. Well, just because the election is close does not mean that GSA should abdicate its responsibility. The law gives GSA the authority to grant funds to the apparent winner. The law does not prevent the GSA from using a little common sense and making funds available to the likely winner. But because GSA has refused to grant the funds to the apparent winner, the Bush-Cheney team is compelled to raise funds for its own transition efforts. Ironically, Governor Bush finds himself in the same position as did all other president-elect prior to the passage of the 1963 Act. He must finance his own transition in order to be prepared to take office on January 20th. I commend him and Secretary Cheney for taking this action, for after all, they are the ones ultimately responsible for putting a good team and good policies together by January 20th. So what does this situation call for? Well, at least for this subcommittee, it calls for us to write and pass legislation to remedy the alleged defects in the Presidential Transition Act by making crystal clear what steps the GSA must take if we again find ourselves in a situation similar to this. That would, be, would only be good for the country. Again, Mr. Chairman, I commend you for calling this hearing. I look forward to the hear hearing from our witnesses and thank them for joining us today. Thank you. I uh, thank the gentlewoman. Thank you very much. And now we're privileged to have the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Five minutes. Thank Hopefully you very statement. much, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're certainly facing an interesting uh, situation that I don't think anybody quite envisaged. And that is that we really, after all this uh, time, which after I think it's 27 days since the uh, presidential election, we're not clear who the next president of the United States will be. A and evidently GSA is not uh, 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 certain about that result either, so they haven't released the funds for the transition period. Now, the, the main legal issue under examination in this hearing is the intent of the Presidential Transition Act and its appropriate application in the unusual circumstances we're facing. Now, the Act requires release of funds to support the transition effort to the apparent successful candidates, as ascertained by the General Services Administrator. And the application of the Act during close elections was discussed when this bill was on the floor. My colleague, Mr. Turner, quoted from uh, then Congressman Dante Fussell, who was one of the authors of this bill, and he said, if they don't know who the winner is, then uh, the administrator uh, shouldn't make any designation. Well, I, uh, I don't know whether we ought to um, say that in the future the administrator ought to um, make some determination tentatively and release funds. That raises a lot of different questions, and I think uh, we ought to examine some of those questions. For example, uh, should the Presidential Transaction, uh, Transition Act uh, uh, consider the implications of having the executive branch announce a judgment 
regarding the election outcome, while the judicial branch is still in the process of considering significant questions relating to the outcome. I, I, I would think we'd want to strive to minimize, not exacerbate, conflicts between the executive and the legislative branches of government. In addition, we should take a thorough look at the practical consequences both of delaying the funding of transition efforts and of funding a transition effort that may have to stop if the other candidate is ultimately declared the winner. Would a delay of several weeks in GSA funding have a critical impact on the effective operations of a new administration? That's an important question. Would it be cost efficient to expend significant taxpayers' dollars on getting a transition office up and running and, and conducting training and orientation for one candidate if the other candidate is later determined to be the winner and then requires the same transition resources? Would it be appropriate to move forward with briefings of transition officials who involve uh, proprietary information or otherwise sensitive government, government information we're not, when we're not certain uh, that these individuals will end up uh, governing? So uh, maybe we want to look at alternative steps. The point is, we're in a very unusual situation right now. We don't know at this point who the next president will be. Now, my colleague from Illinois uh, presented her opening statements as if we know. We know it's already a Bush-Cheney, and therefore they ought to have the funds released for the Bush-Cheney transition. Well, maybe if you, look, if you keep saying that, it'll turn out to be true, but the decision as to who the President of the United States is going to be is not based on how many times you say it's resolved, when we still have a court, many courts, trying to sort through these issues. I, I know there's clearly a strategy on the, on the Republican side to keep on with a mantra, well, we've won, therefore let's don't count the votes. We've won, therefore let's don't go into the courts. We've won, give us the transition money. That, that, uh, that seems to me uh, maybe good public relations to try to change public attitudes about the idea that we ought to ultimately decide who really won. But I, I don't think it makes good policy sense when we're trying to adopt uh, changes to legislation or evaluate the laws that are on the books. The, the, the law says that there has to be an apparent winner. And we leave that up to the GSA. Uh, I, I, all of us want this uh, resolved as quickly as possible, and we know it's important to have the transition funding, but let's make sure that we deal with the real substantive issues as to how the law should work on, on unusual circumstances such as this and not use a hearing or this uh, strange situation we're in simply to repeat the mantra that we won, so don't talk about uh, anything else, give us the funds. That's not really the way to make uh, decisions for these very important issues that are, 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 are going to be before us in the future, and I doubt that we're ever going to have a presidential election as we have today, leaving things as uncertain as they are. If we do, then we ought to think through the best way to, uh, uh, to deal with it, uh, and if the law needs to be changed, we should change it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Rossi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm reminded yesterday morning when my uh, daughters opted to argue with each other that the, at the end of the day, what we need is a president who's, who both he and his team has had a proper amount of briefing and training and education. And I had to, I'm chuckling here somewhat, because I, I ended up dealing with my daughters by asking them, well, today, what are you? And they both scratched their heads, and at the end of the, they finally came up, well, we're sisters. I said, well, on Friday, what are you going to be? And they both scratched their heads, and they both simultaneously turned, well, we're still going to be sisters. Well, at the end of this entire process, you know, we're all still going to be Americans. And it would seem to me that the country is best served, as Mr. Waxman and as Mr. Horne have suggested, by moving this thing forward as expeditiously as possible. I don't understand why, under such unique circumstances, 
we can't take members of both uh, campaign teams and start the transition process. I mean, it's not like we're going to spend all $5.3 million the first day. So I am looking for answers as to how we prepare whoever is going to lead this country for the four years that they'll be in office for. I'm, I mean, I just, at the end of the day, it's like my daughters. I mean, at the end of the week, they're still sisters. They'll be sisters forever. At the end of the day, we're all still Americans. And we still got to make this work. So how do we do that? That's why I came today, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. I thank the gentleman. And now I yield to five minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kanjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I tend to agree with Mr. Waxman that uh, we should shy away from attempting to uh, indicate our preferences for who may win this very close election with the hope that it will have some influence on in the final result. I'm, I, I'm just wondering whether or not we're not spending a lot of time worrying about how, how often a half dollar flip will land on its edge. And uh, we can go through an awful lot of preparation here. It seems to me if we have time to go through preparation here, we have time to go through real reform of government rather than trying to see what we can change after the fact of a close election and transition. Because I'm, I'm sure uh, if I have any insight as to how the Congress functions, nothing we do here at this committee, nothing we formulate now will ever get done in time to affect the uncoming, incoming administration. And that, in fact, maybe everything that we're doing here has to do with affecting the final result. I hope that's not the case, but I have a feeling that that's what it is. Uh, I just heard my colleagues to uh, do what a lot of wise people, I think, in the last several weeks have recommended. Let's step back, take a breath, and let the system go on, resolve this problem, and uh, not try to cause an hysteria either in the country or in the Congress or certainly for the next administration. If one thing I have to say about both candidates, they have staff and advisors around that are eminently qualified to start the transition process. And the fact that they may not have rented facilities or some rented computers will not in any way slow down the processes of the formulation of their government, and it will not uh, impact negatively on their service as president. States. If anything will impact, it's more our hysteria and our failure to respond properly as a Congress and in a bipartisan way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, seeing no other members for an opening statement, I now will call forward uh, the uh, panel one uh, of uh, the witnesses. We have 13 witnesses before us this morning. Uh, the first is the Honorable John H. Sanu, who knew uh, Jack. Uh, Watson, uh, Mark Guerin, Bradley Patterson, and Harry McPherson. There are cards here, gentlemen, and we'll swear you all in at once. Uh, Mr. Watson, Mr. Guerin, Mr. Patterson, McPherson. Swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. Mr. Sununu will be here shortly. And uh, let me just say how we operate. Uh, you, uh, some of you have prepared statements, and a number of you don't have prepared statements because of the last minute that we asked you, and we're very grateful to you. This bit of uh, individual and talent, some of whom I've known over the years, start way back in the Eisenhower administration, of which I was a part. And probably to somebody listening, they say, gee, did he say the Lincoln administration? <laughs> but uh, we have a lot of talent here, and we're delighted to tap your brains. So we're going to start with Mr. Watson, the chief legal strategist for Monsanto Company, former chief of staff for President Carter and Director of President Carter's Transition Teams. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee and the committee. I want to express my appreciation to the subcommittee for the opportunity to be here today and to comment briefly on the subject of presidential transitions, and specifically on the circumstances and challenges that are presented by the current transition. 
There's no question in anyone's mind about the importance of the transition in getting a new administration off to a strong and effective beginning. Under the best of circumstances, it is a formidable challenge for the incoming president and vice president to do in approximately only 10 weeks all those things they need to do in order to assume office on January 20th with a running start. The whole purpose and intent of the Presidential Transition Act of 1963, as amended in 1976 and 1988, and of the Presidential Transition Act of 2000, are to assist the incoming and outgoing presidents and vice presidents in achieving as smooth and seamless a transition of power as possible from one administration to another. Although the circumstances of the current presidential election have unquestionably created an extremely trying and difficult situation for Governor Bush and Secretary Cheney on the one hand and Vice President Gore and Senator Lieberman on the other, there is, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, no constitutional, presidential, governmental, or other crisis here. There is, quite simply, an incredibly close presidential election, the outcome of which needs to be, and I submit will be, resolved as fairly and expeditiously as possible within the coming days. Both presidential candidates have turned to the courts for help in addressing the current situation, as both have a perfect legal right to do. And the state and federal courts are, as we sit here this morning with each other, addressing those requests and reviewing the party's respective positions. The courts fully understand the importance of the issues presented, as well as the incredibly high stakes involved, and I am personally confident are trying to do everything within their constitutional responsibility and authority to resolve the issues in a legal, just, and expeditious way. The courts have an important role to play here, and they are playing it. Once they decide the issues to be decided, the outcome of the election will be determined once and for all, and the duly elected president-elect and vice president-elect, and thankfully, the country itself, will go on about the nation's business. As unusual and exasperating as the current situation is, we should take care not to overreact to it. The sky is not falling, and we shouldn't act as though it is. We should be calm. We should have confidence in our judicial system's ability to deal with the current situation. If I might add, not have confidence in our rather outmoded and outdated voting machines and let the system run its proper course as the Constitution intends it to do. Having said that, Mr. Chairman, there is something very important and very significant that we can do to address another serious problem related not only to presidential transitions but to the proper functioning of the presidency itself. The problem is we have a nomination and confirmation process that is broken and needs fixing. The appointment process in the federal government takes far too long, and the lags in getting people into office are taking a terrible toll on good governance. The gathering of seemingly endless, questionably relevant, but legally required background information, and the filling out of redundant forms takes too long. The FBI field investigations take too long, and in many cases are of questionable value to begin with. And the Senate confirmation process itself also takes too long. This is a problem, as all of you well understand, that will not easily be solved and which it can only be addressed, much less fixed, by a genuinely determined and broad-based bipartisan effort. Groups as varied as the 1989 National Commission on Public Service, chaired by former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, the 1996 20th Century Fund Task Force on Senate Reforms, and the Transition to Governing Project of the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institution 
have all recommended much needed reforms in this area that deserve careful review and considered action by the Congress and the executive branch. I respectfully submit the sooner the better. For the sake of the country, we need to put partisanship aside and institute reforms regarding the presidential appointment process that will permit our presidents, irrespective of their party affiliation, to form their administrations and exercise their leadership without undue delays and unreasonable impediments. Although time does not permit a fuller discussion of this crucially important matter, I strongly commend to the committee's attention an excellent article on the subject which appeared in the November-December 2000 issue of Foreign Affairs magazine. The article was written by Norman Orstein, Ornstein, one of the witnesses you will hear from, I, I believe, this morning, and Tom Donnellan. The article not only concisely discusses the nature and extent of the problem, but outlines several specific recommendations for change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to take questions at the appropriate time if the committee wishes. Well, I thank the gentleman, and I see that uh, Mr. Sununu has arrived. If you'd stand, take the oath, we'll swear you in. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do, sir. Clerk will note that all witnesses have now taken the oath, and uh, we were going to start with Mr. Sununu, so here he is. <laughs> I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, hope that uh, you had been informed that I was going to be arriving at that hour. And we were. I thank you for your indulgence. Uh, I, I will try to be very brief. Um, but I want to emphasize a couple of points. Uh, with all due respect to what I did hear of Jack Watson's testimony, uh, the issue is not whether it is a crisis or not a crisis. The issue is, is whether it is good not to facilitate transition or not good not to facilitate transition. Or more specifically, whether it is right or wrong uh, to not take advantage of tools that have been put into place very wisely uh, by le legislative bodies, the Congress, um, and the executive branch in the past, having gone through the pain and difficulty of the reality of a transition process. Uh, most of the needs are relatively mundane. They are needs for space. They are needs for phone. They are needs for communication. They are needs for travel. They are needs for staff. But they come in a concentrated time, uh, in a concentrated way at a time when there is a premium on that commodity of time. Uh, it is so important to permit a new administration to get started correctly. And I suggest that whatever we do under the breadth and capacity of existing law we find a way to fund that process as soon as possible. It is not just a matter of a one-month delay. There is no time that will be as precious for transition to any new administration as these days and weeks. It is, in fact, the only time where they can focus on preparation rather than focus on, on fulfilling responsibilities of office. A one-month delay now will be reflected in a six-month to six-month to one-year delay in getting things really started. I'm doing this by memory because I did not have time to research the exact number, but my recollection is that there were 40 to 60,000 resumes that arrived at the transition office within the first two weeks of opening the Bush transition office uh, following uh, President Reagan's service. And that was in a transition of like party, where, uh, sadly to say, most of the people who were already in office as Republicans, uh, uh, had been appointed as Republicans, thought they were going to be reappointed. And I would suggest to you that the hardest transition is a like party transition, not a different party transition. Because the hardest thing to do is to do the preparation to get people out not to get people in. Uh, they are both challenging, they are both demanding, and they are both a very important part of the time that is in front of us. Uh, having said that, I want to emphasize that the impact of delay is not linear. 
a one day delay is probably equivalent to now is equivalent to six to ten days of delay after inauguration. Uh, to emphasize the flow of paper, uh, I am not a part of the current transition. I do not expect ever to be asked to be a part of the current transition. I have not offered my services and I have received about two dozen resumes unsolicited from people who want me to somehow impact the appointment process. I will reiterate what Jack Watson has said about reform of the process of appointment and confirmation. It is one of the most critical things we can do to make government work better and it is part of this transition process. One of the most disappointing things to me as, as one who had a responsibility during the transition and as one who had a responsibility serving as chief of staff to President Bush in trying to continue the efforts of the transition in the early days and then fill in voids as they occurred is the reluctance, in fact, sometimes clear unwillingness of individuals to go through the pain of the vetting process not because they have anything to hide, not because they're uncomfortable with revealing data, but because of the cumbersome, nat cumbersome nature of the process and frankly, in some cases, the unbelievable cost. It is not unusual for a major potential appointee to spend between ten and sixty thousand dollars on legal and accounting fees in preparing the forms to be named to a senior position in the federal government. Uh, that is ridiculous. Uh, it makes that position in some cases uh, un, un, unable to be attained by people who are, are not of, of significant means. The process of the forms, the process of the field investigation, and, and frankly, the long delay between appointment and confirmation is a discouraging factor to the, to the best and the brightest and those that we should have in government. And so if, if there is uh, any uh, dividend that you might achieve out of this set of hearings which, which are focusing on the needs of transition, uh, may I suggest, Mr. Chairman, that uh, it would be extremely worthwhile to the country if you could somehow uh, make a very pointed comment and recommendation in that direction. Having said that, uh, I would recommend that, that whatever you do, uh, you find a way to encourage the allocation of some of the existing funds, even if it has to be done initially on a somewhat divided way, uh, to get uh, the two candidates uh, who are still in somewhat doubt as to which one has been selected, although I could tell you if you asked me uh, who it shall be, uh, the, to get the two of them started in an effective way. To force them to rely on private funds is exactly the wrong thing to do and, and the history of the legislation that wisely provided the structure and funding uh, will tell you very clearly uh, how, how much people understood the value of the legislation that was eventually passed. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to participate this morning. Both you and uh, Mr. Watson have had a good opening for us, and uh, I agree with the practicality that both of you faced, and you've all made some good points. I think we can work out a situation, but we'll save that for the question period. And we would like, obviously, all your views is how do you split it up uh, in the uh, short time we have before the administration has to take uh, office one way or the other. So uh, we will now go to Mr. Mark Guerin, uh, pre now president of Hobart and William Smith uh, Colleges in Geneva, New York one of the youngest presidents uh, made available. And he was former deputy chief of staff and communications director for President Clinton in working on various transitions, but he was also president or uh, director of the Peace Corps, which is dear to all of us. Mr. Guerin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. and <clears throat> Thank you for that nice introduction, although while I would observe the time of my appointment as uh, president of Hobart and William Smith, I was at a young age, uh, I believe your tenure as a distinguished college president named at the age uh, of 38 even far exceeded my youthful tenure. So I, I thank you for this invitation. I'm glad to be in your company as well as uh, the other members of the committee and appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here. I come before you today to answer the question that you have posed to this panel 
can the next president be ready? I come to you as having gone through the Senate confirmation process myself as the director of the Peace Corps and as a member of the president's staff, uh, having gone through the requisite clearance and vetting procedure. So in that context, I offer my testimony in addition to my service here on Capitol Hill as, as an aide, and I appreciate this opportunity. You have asked us the question, transitioning to a new administration, can the next president be ready? My answer, without hesitation, is yes. The next president can indeed be ready to take over the office on January 20th, 2001. And while we are witnessing an extraordinary transition, to be sure, I have full confidence that the next president will be able to start his administration with the necessary complement of White House staff and members of his cabinet in the beginnings of the more complete administration as they take power. In fairness, I think it should be observed that the answer to your question has different dimensions for Vice President Gore and Senator Lieberman than it does for Governor Bush and Secretary Cheney. To state the obvious, the Vice President has the opportunity to continue to rely on members of the Clinton administration political appointees as holdover, while Governor Bush would undoubtedly wish to bring in his own team. Nevertheless, it is the case, I believe, that in both transitions that are prudently underway as we speak, they're being coordinated by exceedingly able individuals that I know very well. Rory, Rory Neal for Vice President Gore and Secretary Andy Card for Governor Bush are knowledgeable about the intricacies of a transition and are well positioned to deal with this unprecedented set of facts. Indeed, Secretary Card was my liaison as the incoming uh, deputy uh, during the Clinton uh, transition, Secretary Card representing the Bush administration outgoing. But when one considers your question, can the next president be ready, I answer the following reasons for my very affirmative response. First, when you work backwards from Inauguration Day, what must the president-elect, the newly sworn-in president indeed, have? Certainly a White House staff that must be named and cleared. And while those appointments obviously do not carry Senate confirmation, those clearances are important. And secondly, the cabinet officers as well in place early into the administration. Given that most cabinet appointees come generally from federal or state elected or appointed office, the procedures and necessary background information is frequently known to these appointees. I was pleased to read a recent report in which the FBI has stated they've already taken steps to increase the number of investigators to clear top appointees in a week to 10 days compared with the usual three-week period. I'm sure that will help. The upper levels of presidential appointees, the second, third, and fourth tier uh, appointees, generally follow the inauguration day. Secondly, President Clinton's recent executive order creating a transition coordinating council will, I think, serve as a useful vehicle for streamlining and facilitating this process. This seems to be a good idea in any transition, certainly, but it will be particularly propitious this year. And third, the president-elect will have, and his team will have the benefit of some very important source materials for their appointees. Notably, the recently released uh, Brookings Institution Survivor's Guide for Presidential Appointees that was issued in coordination with the Council on Excellence in Government provides a treasure trove of information for political appointees. In my judgment, this abbreviated transition from the expected 73 days may cause some delays into the administration, but there's no doubt in my mind to answer your question that the new president can be ready with his key appointees. The second, third, and fourth tier appointees may take some longer period of time into the administration. However, to the extent that cabinet secretaries and agency heads have the opportunity to work with career public servants in our departments, in our agencies, this may very well may be a silver lining in our current dilemma. The new appointees will have the chance to see firsthand the skill, the dedication, and the commitment and the competence of career employees of the federal government. In addition, I'm hopeful, like Governor Sununu and Mr. Watson, that this abbreviated transition and the spotlight that it's placing on this entire appointments process 
may lead to some very long needed reforms. Scholars from the Brookings and Heritage Foundation have noted that the increase in delays, confusion, and embarrassment in, in, in the appointment process. They've also found that the entire appointment process favors individuals who've had prior government experience. Indeed, when one observes the growth in the sheer numbers of top-level executive branch appointees, going from 196 in 1961 to 809 in 1993 to 774 in 1998, when you combine those numbers with the sheer length of time that it takes to get an appointment, it's not surprising that we witness such inefficiencies. At a time when we need able and competent and dedicated women and men to come into public service, this is very troubling. On my college campus at Hobart and William Smith, I see a great deal of interest in our students in public service and a great deal of interest to contemplate coming to Washington or in state governments and local governments in serving in public service. Anything you can do to streamline this process would be critically important. So perhaps the reforms that have been suggested in this committee we may be considering to encourage more training and orientation for new department heads and agency heads and presidential appointees may enhance their focus. And again, the spotlight on the antiquated uh, system of the presidential appointment process will lead to streamlining and standardizing and coordinating the financial disclosure reports and avoid the duplication of effort that is frequently so vexing and frustrating to appointees. In addition to, in addition to reducing the burden of filing with both the White House, the Office of Government Ethics, and the United States Senate. And finally, I think one aspect that I'm not sure that even any kind of funding issue would resolve from your part, but one element of this transition that will be missing is the opportunity for the president-elect to build and develop a honeymoon to put shits into the political bank that will serve him well in his tenure as president. Transitions traditionally allow for that reintroduction, if you will, to the American people of the newly elected president in his priorities, in his values, in his statements. I'm not sure any legislation will take back that time. Nevertheless, it's my view, to answer your question again, will the next president be ready? Most affirmatively, yes. This is a resilient country. The presidency has been tested in the past many times, in this decade and in this century. And I have full confidence that with the capacity and competence of the individuals involved on both sides uh, in this present transition, and with your good effort, that the next president can come in and ready and proceeding in that good faith. I appreciate the opportunity to testify, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, those were very helpful comments, and I'm sure more questions will come out between different transitions uh, once we get to the questions. The next gentleman is uh, truly an American civil servant, as well as a political appointee to several presidents. Brad Patterson started in the State Department in 1945, and uh, when I first knew him, he was uh, putting together the cabinet secretariat of President Eisenhower. Needless to say, when President Eisenhower, who probably had more experience than any president in terms of international uh, coalitions and all the rest of it, when he got in there, he couldn't believe it. There was hardly any staff around. And he was used to a staff in the military as supreme commander in uh, Europe. And uh, Mr. Patterson helped uh, pattern all of that. And he has also written a major book now put out by Brookings, uh, the White House staff inside the West Wing and beyond. And that has nothing to do with the uh, current uh, TV uh, West Wing, but they might well take a few examples from Mr. Patterson's book. It's bipartisan. The, uh, Lloyd Cutler and Dick Cheney both have endorsed the book, and uh, we're delighted to have you here. He's been an Arthur S. Fleming awardee when he was one of the ten outstanding young men in the Federal Service. And he's helped everybody from the Indians uh, to uh, the uh, Alaska earthquakes and all the rest of it. So, Mr. Patterson, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your very kind introduction. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I am honored to appear before you this morning and doubly honored to be in the company 
even on this panel, of such distinguished fellow veterans of service on the White House staff. I think the contribution I could best make to the subject of the presidential transition would be to address two aspects of the transition which are important, but not right now in the limelight. First, let me speak about the implications of the transition for the professional staffs of the modern White House. And second, I'd like to mention the pertinency of the transition for a major enterprise also occurring on January 20 next, the inaugural activities which accompany this wearing in. About the professional staffs of the modern White House. In my recent book, The White House Staff, Inside the West Wing and Beyond, I give the total number of what I call the White House staff community. It is 5,915 men and women. That figure includes the domestic, economic, and national security affairs staffs, the White House office, including the First Ladies Group, the Vice President's office, the residents, the military office, the Secret Service units directly serving the President, the National Park Service, Postal Service, and GSA support teams, the White House fellows, detailees, volunteers, and interns. It excludes the rest of the executive office, except those in the Office of Administration directly supporting the White House. So that White House staff family numbers nearly 6,000 people. On January 20, what will happen? Will all the desks be vacated, all the file cabinets cleaned out, all the shelves emptied? Fortunately, no. As to people, there are two traditions in presidential service. The first tradition is that no person has tenure in his or her desk at the White House. That means that every person's service in the White House staff community is entirely at the pleasure of the president. The second equally strong tradition is that while policy officials change, hundreds of the technical and support personnel of the modern White House are invited to stay on to serve the next president. In fact, many have served several presidents over three or four decades. One executive clerk, Bill Hopkins, served 40 years under seven presidents. One of Mr. Hopkins' predecessors, Maurice Latta, served 50 years. The office of the executive clerk is a particularly good example of professional continuity at the White House. That's the office which handles all of the public papers of the president, and roll bills coming from Congress, executive orders, proclamations, commissions, messages to Congress. A little vignette. In the years past, such messages to Congress were delivered by the clerk, dressed in formal attire, riding a bicycle to the Capitol. The executive clerk's office is a treasure house of wisdom on White House procedures. On January 21, for instance, if a brand new White House staffer exclaims, how do we get an executive order issued? He or she can ask the executive clerk and find out immediately. The present executive clerk has been there for 21 years. The new first family will be welcomed into the executive residence by the chief usher, a 32-year veteran. Some of his 91-member staff have served in the mansion for more than three decades. The new first family can bring in a new chef, of course, but they would be damn fools if they fired all the butlers and waiters or the telephone operators or the 2,200 men and women who staff the military office, fly Air Force One on the helicopters, manage Camp David, and who set up the incredibly sophisticated communications equipment which keeps a U.S. president while visiting a hamlet in China tied into all his worldwide military commanders. 100 National Park Service staff maintain those White House 18 acres. 133 GS engineers keep up the EOB and the East and West Wings. 1,200 Secret Service professionals protect the First Family, wherever any of them are. The President, the First Family, the nation are fortunate to have such dedicated and strictly non-political associates in the modern White House. They personify the presidential transition at its best. One Reagan White House veteran remembered, and I quote, when we came here, there were some people who wanted to dismiss every single person who was on the White House payroll. Now, the president certainly has the authority to do so, but there had been a time-honored group of people within the White House who basically lived from president to president, served the presidency, were proud of that association, but kept things working. The White House telephone operators are a perfect example of that. And yet, there were some in our transition who said, let's get rid of the White House operators. I fought those actions, and the president agreed. We were successful in preventing inexperienced people from the campaign 
from coming over to the White House and getting jobs that might embarrass the White House or the President. As for those file cabinets, not totally empty, luckily. I have peeked at the executive clerk's card files. The first entry is dated 1911. The clerk's office maintains a collection of loose-leaf notebooks, the pages of which set forth the statutory authority for every single presidential appointment. The clerk lets no nomination document pass up to the Oval Office unless it conforms to the legal parameters. That card file and those notebooks stay right in the White House. In the councils and chief of staffs and the president's physician's offices is another vital collection of papers, the emergency manual. When, following the Reagan assassination attempt in 1981, Counsel Fred Fielding started to discuss the 25th Amendment and saw the cabinet's eyes, as he said, glaze over, Fielding and his successors, among them Boyden Gray and Lloyd Cutler, worked to compile a manual covering every possible contingency of presidential disability. That compilation remains in the White House. So hopefully will the new 131-page staff manual which the Clinton White House has put together, summarizing White House procedures and rules of the road for its employees, how to book a conference room, how to arrange for a foreign visitor. The staff manual lays out all the laws and regulations about ethics for White House personnel. Such a compendium is surely designed to survive the transition. In finishing this section of my testimony, allow me to quote one paragraph from my book. The White House, then, is not empty at the inaugural noon. Throughout its expectant halls, in its foyers and kitchens, at its switchboards and guard posts, men and women who are, are on duty who will serve tomorrow as they served yesterday. Some have walked taller in the mornings of two, three, or four decades, committed and proud to support the office which they honor and the house which they revere. They will continue to be unknown to their fellow Americans, and some of them even to their president, who years later will depart as they again remain. Their respectful loyalty is always transferred to each new executive, and president after president is rewarded by their service. Now, in addition to the empty transition offices, about which the subcommittee will hear other testimony this morning, there is another contingent of nervously expectant men and women in town, those preparing for the inaugural. There are three inaugural institutions here at the Capitol. There is the Joint Commission Congressional Committee for the inaugural, which is in charge of all the swearing-in preparations and the ceremony itself. I'm sure the work of that committee is well underway. Although committee members will be needing to get word about the list of dignitaries and friends to whom it should send the formal invitations, which list? There is the Armed Forces Inaugural Committee, AFIC, which is also or already organized and at work, since the Department of Defense, the Military District of Washington, and the various armed services contribute so much to all the inaugural activities. The overall direction of the inaugural will, however, come from the Presidential Inaugural Committee, the chair and vice chair and members of which must be chosen right away by the president-elect. And the inaugural program consists of much, much more than the swearing in. Typically, there are a reception for distinguished ladies, the inaugural gala, a governor's reception, a reception honoring the vice president-elect and his wife, a dance for young Republicans, Democrats, an inaugural medal, inaugural decorations, inaugural license plates, an inaugural concert, the inaugural parade, a cocktail buffet for the National Citizens for Bush Corps, and the inaugural ball held in eight or nine separate downtown locations. It was expected that the transition period this year would be, as usual, some 74 days, and as you can appreciate from that listing of inaugural activities, every last day of those 74 is desperately needed as lead time for these massive events, having thousands of enthusiastic celebrants at the inaugural concert, designing and striking a special inaugural medal, engraving, addressing, and mailing 100,000 invitations to the ball, organizing and staging a three or four long parade, and so forth. We used to have 74 days, now only 47. To quote Senator Slade Gordon, I am cautiously pessimistic. Well, I'll, I'll finish my testimony a little early. I do want to compliment the General Services Administration for setting up not only the presidential transition offices as per the legislation, but there is another piece of legislation, Public Law 9626, which authorizes GSA to support the inaugural. And there is another separate suite of offices, empty offices, which they've established with a little committee and a staff of 30 already there on 600 uh, in Independence Avenue. So the GSA 
is poised and ready to go. The question is, are we? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. That's uh, most interesting, and I think probably everybody's ears went up when you said 5,900 staff members at the White House. Uh, <laughs> And uh, when you think that the Brownlow Commission suggested to President Roosevelt that you could get along with six anonymous assistants, and he ran the Second World War on that basis, both civil and uh, international. We now go to a gentleman that has been here many years, and both in the Capitol for the legislative branch and uh, in uh, the various White Houses, as well as various departments. Harry McPherson is sort of a legend around here. And uh, if you want to read the finest book that has ever been written on uh, the Senate of the United States in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, read A Political Education, Atlantic Brown, 72. Uh, Mr. McPherson not only is a great observer, he's also a very literate writer. And that's the most, uh, really, it's the, it's the finest book I've ever seen on the House and the Senate and the executive branch. So, Mr. McPherson, we're uh, delighted to have you here. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for that uh, very much, more than I can say. Uh, you and I go back uh, to the days of Lyndon Johnson and Tommy Keekle in the uh, United States Senate, and it's wonderful to be before you today. Uh, I'd like to adopt every, almost everything that's been said here, because I think it's all uh, right on, and I hope the uh, subcommittee has uh, absorbed it and, uh, and will do so. I just have a, no, I have no prepared testimony, but I have a few observations and anecdotes to tell, as any uh, one who's been around here too long has. Uh, one thing is that I, I share uh, Jack Watson's view that uh, this is not a crisis uh, at, at the moment uh, for the reason, and I believe, that both campaigns, both presidents, uh, potential presidents, are surrounded by uh, veterans of uh, Washington. This, uh, this transition uh, procedure that the Congress has encouraged and, and developed over the years, I think is most valuable for an administration coming in uh, from the hinterland with very little experience in Washington. That's not the case with either the Bush uh, or the Gore uh, campaigns. Uh, Governor Bush himself was here with his father. Uh, his vice president uh, served as chief of staff in the White House as well as defense secretary. Vice President Gore, Senator Lieberman, that, that uh, is, uh, doesn't require uh, dwelling on. Both of them are surrounded by former, by veterans of administrations from the Pentagon and State Department and elsewhere. This is not, uh, uh, bump, uh, you know, uh, this is not uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, coming to somebody coming uh, from the country who's never seen the White House or the Washington Monument. It, it's not this situation at all. And so uh, I think the transition assistance that is most desperately needed by an ingenue administration uh, is not, not so required by this one. In my view, the biggest um, question for a new administration is not so much where it's going to be housed or uh, how many bucks it's going to have to pay for this or that. Uh, uh, transitional assistance. It's an attitudinal one. The biggest question is whether the incoming uh, group is prepared to listen to the people who are already here. And let's say if, uh, if the Bush group is willing to sit down and pay attention to serious people in the Clinton administration as they talk about the issues they have confronted and uh, the, because I can tell you that there is no, there is no way for uh, even these veterans I've just been talking about to be thoroughly up to speed on the big issues that a president will confront right from January 20th on. And the Middle East, uh, relations with Russia, 
uh, with uh, parts of Asia, uh, Latin America, the foreign policy ones are the most obvious, but the domestic ones as well. And my, I had my own experience in 1968, uh, made this a particularly uh, uh, poignant question. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson was determined that his administration would have uh, not only uh, a leave behind not only a great society, but would have the best transition uh, uh, effort that any administration ever had. So each one of us in our offices was told to prepare uh, everything that anybody would need in coming in <coughs> to our office. I prepared two enormous notebooks for my successor, a guy named John Ehrlichman, I've told this story before in Ehrlichman's presence, so I don't feel as if I'm, I'm uh, these are uh, uh, bad stories after those who passed on. Um, I spent two hours talking to John about what the special counsel to the president did. Uh, and I showed him memoranda that I'd written to Lyndon Johnson that were quite um, revealing. In fact, uh, maybe even dangerous, I showed, because Johnson had told us to do that, tell him everything that we have to confront. He never asked a question. And you know, after a while, even if you're a uh, special counsel to the president or a congressman or whatever, if you've described what you do for about two hours, you pretty well run out of steam. So I said, well, um, what would you like to do? And he said, well, could we have some lunch? So we went down to the White House mess, and he said, I do have two questions. Uh, who gets to eat here in the White House mess? That was one. And the second one was, when do you get to use White House cars for personal purposes? Well, I mean, you can say that John Ehrlichman really had his eye on the ball and not on all this talk about policy and stuff, but I was rather appalled because I had done my best. And there, I, when I talked to him about it, I have to say this, when he got out of prison, and I, he and I were on a panel one time, and we were talking, and I mentioned this story, and he said, you know, I'd never had, I was such an arrogant jerk when I came in. I, I just didn't want to hear anything from anybody in the Lyndon Johnson administration. So my, my point in telling the story uh, and, about uh, Ehrlichman, who I came to like a lot and was a good guy, my point in telling the story is that both sides, both the incumbent administration and the new one coming in, have got to really talk, and they've got to really open up. And it's a matter of attitude more than statute or, or, uh, or appropriations. Uh, to go back to what the gentleman from California said uh, in his opening remarks, I don't see any reason on earth why the current administration can't work with both uh, campaigns uh, about serious uh, emergent issues right now. I'm talking about sitting down with them and saying, here's what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, there's no reason why that has to wait until uh, this uh, Florida recount uh, is resolved. It can happen today. It can start today. And the, the kind of, of uh, urgent uh, issues that we want our new president to be able to handle, uh, uh, is uh, that's something that can, can be done if they will it, will it to be done. The last thing I'll say is I just amen to what everyone has said, John Sununu and Jack Watson and uh, Brad and Jack, uh, about, uh, and, and Mark Guerin and his eloquent uh, remarks. Uh, this appointments process is nuts. The press has a lot to do with it. I don't know how you can change the press and get them off this business of nitpicking every appointment and everybody's holdings of a mutual fund that may have 50 stocks that will ultimately be affected in some way by someone's uh, decision in uh, the executive branch. It's, we just have to, we have to uh, get real uh, because otherwise people are simply not going to put themselves through this mess of an appointments process. Thanks. You're not quite done yet. I just, before, since you're under oath and you want to swear to this, uh, were you there in the meeting that uh, President Johnson called with his six top aides and what he told you about what you should do with members of Congress? Valenti tells the story very well. No, I... I, I well, 
I, maybe you weren't, but uh, I think that was a, it, every, that must have been at the every Austin, administration that coming into the White House, regardless of party, ought to take that advice. And in brief, what he said was, look, when you get a call from a member of Congress, the Senator of the House, you answer it this day, even if it's 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock. Right. And if you don't, I'm going to kick you right out of here. That's, so. I've heard Jack tell that story. And I didn't, so. uh, I didn't uh, do the uh, other things that Johnson said in course <laughs> to uh, make it really Clean register. It but that, that, uh, that was a very fine administration in relating to the Hill, obviously because he'd been a former leader. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate all the wisdom we've had from all of you here. And uh, now we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I'm going to start with the ranking member, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it seems to me that all of our witnesses today have talked about the difficulty of uh, the appointments process and confirmation of potential appointees, uh, the vetting process that must take place. Uh, Mr. Watson, I know you addressed that uh, in your remarks. Uh, give, us, uh, give us some concrete suggestions here. You're talking about this subcommittee perhaps trying to make improvements in this area, and yet I've, I'm not sure I've gotten a handle on exactly what uh, we ought to consider uh, doing as a, a matter of change in the law to improve that situation. Thank you, Mr. Turner. The article that I commended to the committee's attention, I want to reemphasize, is an article, uh, again, that appeared in the November-December issue this year of Foreign Affairs. It is written by Mr. Norman Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute and Mr. Tom Donilon, who in the Clinton administration served as the chief of staff to the Secretary of State. And in that article, Mr. Turner, there are numerous recommendations as to what can be done by both the executive branch and the Senate and indeed the Congress at, at large. For example, um, so much of this, as Mr. McPherson said, and as John Sununu and others would agree, is a matter of attitude. It is a matter of a genuinely and profound bipartisan determination to do something about it. Uh, one of the things that the article uh, points to is the, the tradition in the Senate of the hold on nominees that frequently has absolutely nothing to do with the, the merits or demerits, the qualifications or lack thereof of the prospective appointee, but may have to do with something totally, totally impertinent to, to, <coughs> to that issue. Another, there are literally a half a dozen different forms, Mr. Turner, that have to be filled out that in which there is an enormous redundancy. John Sununu said, I believe it was John, perhaps Mark. People have to spend between ten and sixty thousand dollars in retaining lawyers and accountants simply to fill out forms. Uh, the forms information of which is of truly doubtful relevance to the issue of fitness for office. So eliminating redundancy and duplication of forms, uh, creating as the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institution are are working on and are recommending a common electronic nominations form that will serve all purposes is another idea. <coughs> Decriminalize the appointment process. As, as strange as that sounds, Congressman, as it stands right now, information that is provided in the course of filling out these forms can serve as the basis for criminal investigation when I think the true intent of Congress was not to do that. So again, that's a subject that requires careful review. I'm not suggesting that there, that we suspend the, the judicial process in these matters, but that's a subject that needs to be looked at. Streamlining the FBI background check, setting a clearer set of standards as to what it is we're looking for in terms of information that pertains 
to the qualification of the man or woman who is being nominated to fill a particular post and focusing on that kind of information and, and no other. It has been suggested by some, and I think this deserves a careful congressional review, that we might have full field investigations only for the most sensitive national security and defense positions and not for other even high-ranking positions in the government. A fair question, Congressman, is do we need those full field investigations for an undersecretary of health and human services or a, an assistant secretary of, trans of transportation? I say that not meaning to imply that those positions are of any less importance, but the nature of their role and responsibility is so radically different that it calls into mind, into question, and certainly in my mind, whether or not you need that full field investigation. These are some of the things that are suggested. Uh, there are other Senate procedural reforms that were outlined in that 1996 20th century fund report that I mentioned in my testimony to which I would refer the committee's attention. But by way of example, Congressman, those are some of the things that I think deserve a very, very close attention. Finally, virtually none of that would make a difference unless the Democrats and the Republicans come together and say, we're going to fix this process together, no matter who the next president is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now yield five minutes for questioning to the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Ms. Biggert, the gentlewoman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in a, a memo uh, dated thir November 13, 2000, uh, John Podesta, the White House Chief of Staff, issued a memo to the uh, heads of executive departments and agencies in which he said that, uh, uh, and I quote, you may continue to provide the kind of information or assistance, if any, that you typically provide to presidential candidates and should continue to provide prepare for the transition so that we are able to provide full assistance quickly to the office of the president-elect. Uh, do you think that, um, that within those parameters that uh, either the Republican or the Democrat receives the necessary information? Uh, you, you were talking about uh, sitting down and, and having policy discussions, and yet I, I wonder if, as a president, or a presidential candidate, where they really have access to some of the information that they might want to start on uh, early on. Maybe uh, Mr. Guerin, I think you talked about that. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, Mr. Podesta's intent there certainly is clear. And I, I think it underscores, I believe, what Mr. McPherson's point was, which I think is the salient point here, is that in this process, and I was, uh, as I mentioned, Secretary Christopher's deputy, and walked into my very first meeting in the Roosevelt Room with the outgoing Bush administration, with Mr. Baker and Andy Card, with Mr. Card being our main liaison. And because of our friendship and because of his, in my view, personal integrity and character, the relationship of that transition was, was vastly enhanced. And certainly it's a credit to, I believe, Mr. Card in particular, but also they're honoring that process. It would be my hope. That was certainly the intent of, of Mr. Podesta and certainly the president who would want to have that kind of access. I think the president's executive order certainly is consonant with that. It is a tonal dimension to this transition that in the end the awkwardness, whether it's a friendly takeover or a hostile takeover of administrations. Um, but those relationships, I think starting with the top, with the access provided and with that goodwill, certainly would provide any incoming transition team with the access and support that they would need. Uh, Governor Sununu. Yeah, I, I don't want to be the one that uh, is on the other end of the spectrum here alone, but I, I, I don't mind doing that if necessary. I think something is, is being missed here. The, the transition void that is being created is not in being able to name uh, uh, a handful or two handful or, or the complete cabinet in time. It is not in, in not being able to name the 10 top staff members in the White House. 
it is not the fact of, and the problem is, is in not being able to have the detailed interaction, for example, that allows uh, the potential president and his staff to prepare a budget for presentation to Congress with full access into the Office of Management and Budget. It is an inability to put together the full structure of, of a personnel office that will move into the White House and then begin to add personnel as, as uh, after Inauguration Day. It is the inability to prepare a staff and structure and have them begin to interact with the, fully with the existing press office and begin to prepare for a smooth transition there. It is the inability of the legal counsel and the supporting members of the legal counsel's office to begin to prepare all the materials and assist everybody in filling out uh, these unbelievably complex forms and to begin to inform them of the subtle issues that are involved in the criminalization aspects that was addressed by Jack Watson. It is the inability of, of putting together a staff support structure and having them interact and have full access to the manuals that Mr. McPherson and Mr. Patterson referred to uh, and, and all the archives that are there on a full basis so that they can begin to, to deal with the issues that are associated with paper flow for the president, the issues that are associated with making sure the staff is aware of all their responsibilities, not just the mythical responsibilities of each position that is there. It is the telecommunications access that is necessary to begin to communicate back and forth all the details that are necessary for potential members of, uh, that, that are going to be appointed uh, to understand what is happening. So it is not the problems at the top it is the problems in layers through two through ten that are not being supported in this void. And it is that that is going to be the most dramatic problem. Let me give you one example from my own personal experience uh, that, that was absolutely critical, and it had to do with the savings and loan issue. Uh, if we had not had full briefings and opportunities to go into details with second, third, fourth, and fifth tier members um, of uh, uh, the departments that were associated there, we would have never had the capacity to get a good head start in making a, a new policy decision on what should or should not be done to deal with the savings and loan crisis. And I think one of the most important things President Bush did is immediately on coming into office, having had his transit, what was then his transition group and then his new cabinet, speak directly and forcefully on the basis of their briefings, uh, he made the quick decision of fix it and fix it fast, which I think was absolutely critical in restructuring the financial institutions in this country, and I believe was the critical factor in fueling the kind of recovery that we've eventually had. Thank you. I see my time has expired. I, if I might, uh, since I think that's a relevant question for all of you, let me put it this way. What's the biggest mistake made by administrations you belong to that could have been avoided by a more complete or comprehensive transition, because that's sort of what you're talking about, Mr. Sanudo. I'd like to hear, I think the panel would, from each of you, where did, where would a shortness of it, and you know the little uh, we've had it, it's an evolution here, but uh, did you see mistakes made because of the compression of that? Where, Mr. Me? Watson. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Excuse Mr. Me. Watson. Mr. Chairman. Uh, any transition, 10 weeks or less, absolutely requires the people running the transition to exercise exclusion, to keep things off the agenda that don't need to be there. Exclusion of any matters that the president is not going to have to deal with in the first six months of his administration, for example. The purpose of a transition is not to plan for a presidential administration in whole. It is to get the president and his new administration off to a running start uh, and deal with those issues and the appointments and so forth that must be done, must be addressed in the period between January 20th and the, and the, re the summer recess of the Congress. So I would say, Mr. President, that a mistake that we made in some respects and that almost every transition makes to one degree or another is not exercising that 
power, that constant power of saying no, the internal and external pressures on a president-elect to put things on the agenda are overwhelming. Everybody wants to have their issue, their point of view, their perspective, their matter, their item on the agenda, and you have to focus to keep them off. Mr. Guerin, anything you want to add to? Well, I think that's, that's very well said, Mr. Chairman, and, and similarly, I, I think we do not have the time to detail all of our uh, Well, give us a, two, uh, mistakes, a few certainly. horror stories, but, uh, at least. Uh, 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 I can easily do that. Um, I think the, the one observation I would make uh, is that from our point in Washington, our vantage point in Washington, where we put together briefing books and cluster groups to study all the cabinet departments and agencies, everything from the Tuna Commission to the Department of Defense. But what we did not study, uh, per the then President-elect, was the White House in the kind of detail and rigor. And uh, I think the President would certainly join me in, in his observation that transition team, if we are going to study the cabinet, agency departments and that kind of detail would be well placed to, to have that kind of uh, rigorous study and analysis. Mr. Patterson. Mr. Chairman, as you will recall, precisely what Mark was talking about, about conversations between outgoing and incoming White House staff, are, were the objective of the very um, helpful amendment which was your committee approved and the Congress approved in the Transition Presidential Address Act of, of 2000 namely for providing workshops and briefings. Uh, that had not been the case in the past, uh, and uh, now is the case. Of course, the problem is the time is, is creeping shorter and shorter, but that authority is there, and uh, the public administrators, such as the distinguished gentleman you'll be hearing from later, Dwight Inc. behind me, and many others, and, the, and your committee and the committee in the Senate were wise enough to, uh, to uh, approve that amendment, and it is on the books, so as soon as a, a new team is, is for surely definite, uh, that those new provisions will be there. And uh, I know that many of us in the public administration community commend uh, the Congress for that wisdom. Uh, Mr. McPherson, uh, did you, uh, because of the uh, compression of that uh, thing, it's of course different, it was a party within uh, an executive branch when you started with the uh, uh, cabinet members and other key advisors after the president uh, was tragically assassinated. President Johnson had his hands full. He did. I, I was not in the White House for that first year, but uh, I was fairly close to him and, uh, and others. And I believe that if Lyndon Johnson had a heyday in the presidency, if he really made a gigantic contribution that, that uh, people in both parties would acknowledge it was in his handling of the government of, of the of the presidency in that first year after November 22nd 1963 uh, he he did it uh, uh, using his tremendous knowledge of Congress but going far beyond that he connected with everyone of significance uh, in the life of a presidency, uh, business leaders, labor leaders, civil rights leaders. He made it a practice to bring in everybody who hated him whom, and whom he hated, but who were significant. Uh, he lined them up. I was with him on nine days after he became president, one Sunday. I spent Sunday sitting in the Oval Office with him, just listening to him talking to people whom I knew he despised and who certainly didn't like him, but who, whom he needed if, he, if the government was to function. And each of those people came out and said things to the press that were very supportive. We really want to help this president. He's really going to try to work. He was on the phone constantly with Everett Dirksen and with Charlie Halleck and with the, the leaders of the the Republicans in the Congress. Uh, he really worked it, uh, uh, 16, 18 hours a day. His staff, as Jack Valenti will tell you and would tell you if he were sitting here today, uh, was worked just down to the bone uh, by uh, Johnson, who was determined not just to win the election in 1964, but to make the country work again after it had been brought to a, a, a shuddering halt. 
and Dallas. Any other addition? Mr. Sununu, you used to open that question, so do you want to close out on it? Well, the biggest mistake I think we made is, is even though we heard to a great extent everything you're hearing here today about the difficulties of the appointment process and about how hard it is uh, to get good people to come in, I think we underestimated to some extent uh, the burden that that would be in getting the good people approved and, and confirmed and, and, and through there. You hear the words, you read the words, you get good counsel, and until you do it, you don't understand how serious that problem really is, and I think we underestimated it a bit. Well, we, uh, let's see, go over here now to uh, what happened to the gentleman from California. We'll yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kandorsky. Questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, in listening to the observations and some of the testimony, I, 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 I see us going in what I think is a very positive direction, is that is the real problems associated with transitions of administrations as opposed to uh, the immediate problem that we're faced with of not having the certainty of who is actually the next president. Glad to see everyone taking that course because there's nothing that should come out of this hearing that gives any uh, indication of who should be the winner or the loser of this contest that's before us. But, I, I, Mr. Chairman, I have to confess that I've been around here long enough now to have experienced some of what the gentlemen are talking about. That really scares me. That means that maybe I am here too long. But I agree with Mr. Sununu. I sat on the banking committee, and the most impress, impressive activity of President Bush was on January 8th, some 12 days before his inauguration, he sent the formulation to the Banking Committee of how to handle the SNL crisis. I have to say, I'm a Democrat, as you know, but, but that impressed me so much. I had noticed, sir. <laughs> that impressed me so much uh, that uh, this incoming president would take such a difficult issue and complicated and un understandable issue by the general public but to resolve it, and as you know, we had been trying to resolve that issue from the early 80s. Uh, but I had great hopes uh, for his presidency as a result of that. I won't go into what errors that may have been made later on in the presidency. Uh, the experience I had uh, in the transition in 92, uh, after the Bush administration, and I don't know whether it was the court cases that were going on at the time, but I remember so well uh, being in the White House the day after inauguration, trying to get something done that had to be done uh, uh, concurrently between the two new and the changing administration. And all the computer computers were gone. The guts were taken out of the computers. And, and we were actually working, uh, rather than using computers to do documents, we had to go back to manual typewriters. And of course, it was, uh, I, 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 I saw the wrinkled brow. I think it may have been a court order uh, some litigation that was pending that seized all that information to make sure they could find out what people were thinking or writing about. But it certainly did slow down the implementation of that administration. And then I remember the fact that everybody was astounded that they had the Lyndon Johnson telephone still there uh, about 20 years behind times. And that, that took a little bit to rewire that situation. So every White House uh, coming and going uh, has its difficulties. What I'm interested in is uh, the observations, perhaps, uh, from this distinguished panel of how badly do we do up here on the Hill. And it's interesting. We can put a committee together to handle an inauguration and do a pretty damn nice job of it. But I don't know any committee that comes together, the Congress, the House, and the Senate, for transition purposes. And it, it strikes me as it's much more important than having a parade to have a nice, smooth uh, entrance of the leadership of the new government which we easily could facilitate here and now. Uh, finally, uh, I, I can't help but ask this question. Every administration that I've seen come through and every transition, uh, and the last one we had, uh, Nanogate and drugs. Are we over those two things now? And does anybody have any idea what the next disqualifying past vicious occurrence other than hiring a nanny is going to be for all these people that we have to cast aside. Uh, does anybody have any idea out there what we should prepare the American people for? Uh, and 
I'm just wondering whether or not, is that a political activity that's occurring? Are we in the Congress throwing these things out and trying to weaken uh, people who are qualified to serve from coming? Or is that a media circus that's occurring? And if so, what can we all do about it? I remember, and I'm calling the Nanogate and the drug situations, if we think about it, the beginning years of the Clinton administration, so many very fine, qualified people had to step aside and leave and not be considered or be terribly embarrassed, those that were considered. And it drug the process out considerably. I think we're looking at the acting attorney general during those hard periods there when we couldn't even put into place someone in charge of the Department of Justice. Uh, are we doing that again? Is that a possibility or, and if you will? I can't tell you what the next nanny gate type issue will be. Uh, you'll have to ask the press. Uh, they will find one and they will make it. What is incumbent on us collectively, Republican and Democrat, uh, is perhaps to uh, commit ourselves not to exploit what they raise. And uh, the easiest way for that to be snuffed uh, is, is for a bipartisan, uh, significant bipartisan group to say, we hear what you're saying, that is not the qualification that we care about for Attorney General, as it was in that case. Uh, we, are, we hear that, we see that, it is a flaw that, is remediated, that can be remediated, and we are going to only address the significant qualifications for that office. Now, that's not easy to do. I, I don't pretend that it's easy to do politically. Uh, we, we are often uh, tempted beyond our capacity to do the right thing, but if we keep worrying about it and talking about it and di having a dialogue on how to deal with it, maybe eventually we can give each other mutual strength uh, and be able to come to that point where we can stand up and say that's really not significant. Let's move on. Mr. Jan uh, Kanjorski, I'm two quick points in response to some of what you've just said. One, I agree with John. We can't predict what the next one's going to be. But what we can predict is that whatever it is, it will take courage and common sense for the members of the Congress to deal with whatever it is, focusing on the real question that's put to the Congress in terms of the confirmation procedure, is the person who's been nominated for the post fit or not fit for the post? And all information that is relevant and important to that question is what we should consider and not other, point one. Point two, with respect to your earlier question about what more the Congress can do, I can only speak from my own experience, Congressman. In 1976, I'm afraid I, I bore more resemblance to the Mr. Smith comes to Washington than to the old uh, hand in Washington affairs. I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, under oath, that the reception I received as the director of the transition for President-elect Carter in 1976 from the members of this Congress from the committee and subcommittee chairs, budget, and others, was exemplary. Uh, it was unstinting. It was practical. It was honest. Um, I'm looking at Congressman Jack Brooks. It was Congressman Jack Brooks that I personally worked with to amend the 1963 Act to increase the funding under the Act from $900,000 to the three million that we put into place in the 1976 Act. And all I had to do with Mr. Brooks was to come before him and say, Mr. Brooks, will you, will you help, help us understand and analyze what needs to be done here? And he then did it. So I think with the, with the transition acts which the Congress has passed, Congressman, with the funding it has made available, with the amendments that it has passed in the 2000 Presidential Transition Act in terms of briefing support and orientation support. The Congress is doing its part here. Mr. Chairman, just an observation as a footnote. One remembers constitutionally there is no transition. Power changes in noon of January 20. I recall Eisen President Eisenhower in his last cabinet meeting in which I was present, telling them, admonishing them, first of all, to collaborate with the Kennedy folks 
and help them help them out in every way possible. But then immediately he reminded the cabinet, there's just one president, gentlemen, and that's me until noon of the 20th. <laughs> and he didn't want any, any of the, the new folks making statements or pretending to speak for the government. So he just, he just reminded them that January 20 noon was had that constitutional aspect to it. Okay, I see uh, no more answers to that question, and I'll now uh, yield five minutes for questioning to uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Osi, which who will be followed by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really only have uh, one question. I want to direct it to Mr. Watts and Mr. McPherson, and then the others can respond. From a legal standpoint, does the Presidential Transition Act provide flexibility in a situation like we are experiencing today, or does it narrow our choices? In other words, is there an interpretation that can be made of the Presidential Transition Act that would allow both campaigns basically to be provided the assistance they need in anticipation that one of them will be the winner. Congressman, I'm, I would not present myself as an authority on the Chief presidential. Legal strand, former Chief. <laughs> <laughs> I've read it carefully, however, and I'll try to answer your question. We really have two lines of help coming here, at least two lines of broad categories of help. One is money. And I, if, I, if my memory serves me, we've got $7.1 million appropriated for this purpose currently, about $5.3 million of it to be divided among the incoming and outgoing presidents and vice presidents. That's one. And I think that the act probably as a legal interpretation matter, is, is less flexible as to the release of those funds than it is with, with respect to point two of the assistance. Point two of the assistance really goes to what John Sununu was talking about. It is the making available of information. It is the sharing of briefing books that have already been prepared. It is the, it's the sharing with both camps, in my opinion, would be fully permissible under the act of, budget, of budget information, of other information related to defense and economic issues. Again, I would, I would hearken back to what I said um, a few moments ago, sir, that we must keep in mind that in a transition, you're only able to focus effectively on the most immediate and the highest priority issues with which the president is going to have to deal in the early days and weeks and months of his administration. With respect to those issues, I think there is flexibility under the act for the assistance to be provided to both camps under the current situation. If I might follow up on that then, Mr. Watson, the, the issue you're pointing out is that that particular assistance, that second type, is not something that necessarily would fall to GSA. It's, as Mr. Sununu implicitly suggested, that's something much more personal. Yes. It's sort of like the height of responsibility. You know, one of you is going to be president. Yes. Come in here. Exactly. Okay. And I'll tell you just again out of my own experience, Congressman, in 1980, when we lost the election to Governor Reagan, at the president's direction, I again headed the transition, this time from the position of Chief of Staff at the White House. We had prepared in all the departments and major agencies of the government briefing books for the new people, which we immediately made available to Governor Reagan and his people. Uh, I, I believe, I'm not a part of any of these transition efforts here, but I believe based on what I've read and understand to be true, that such briefing materials are available now, and it would be my recommendation that on that informal basis, which is permitted under the Act, that information be made available to both sides. All right. I want to go to Mr. McPherson. If I don't see any, any uh, bar to the kind of cooperation we've been talking about between uh, the incumbent administration and both, both campaigns. None at all, uh, in, so far as the serious stuff is concerned. 
the issues that they're going to, the new guy's going to confront. From a practical side, Governor Sinema, any observations? Yeah. In order to share materials, you have to have people with a place to be where that material can be shared. You have to have people in place, and you have to have offices for those people in place, and you have to have telephones for them to use in a coherent basis, not picking a phone up in one law office or, or another <coughs> office in town, but in a concentrated area. So, uh, in theory, what, what Jack has addressed can be done. In practice, I don't think it can be done unless GSA makes available some facilities and some phones and some support structure so that the people that are going to share this material have a, cohere a place where they can come together as a coherent entity and start working to take advantage of what is being shared. Mr. Chairman, may I have just the liberty of the committee to ask one other question? Certainly. Are you aware any bar, of any bar under the current Presidential Transition Act that pre preclude GSA from providing such assistance today to both campaigns? I am not a lawyer, and I thank the Lord for that, uh, so I can't give you a legal answer to that. But from what I have read in the documents, there is nothing th that would do that except that they would be giving less money eventually and less, facility, uh, less money eventually uh, to, to the one that is eventually chosen. In other words, some of the funds will have been expended on, on someone who would not end up being the president. But other than that bar in terms of the total amount of money that's there, I do not believe that there is a problem. So if, if we had four, uh, five point whatever million, uh, split it equally, 2.65 each, I mean, we spent 2.65 million in the space of the time that I've had to question the panel. So, I mean, I don't see this as something that's... It, it's not a problem, except that, that if, if someone would have to make do with only 2.65 million... Until such time until as Until such time as you, as, un, that you added it, and the question is whether you feel you can add to the process when the final uh, um, uh, winner is selected. Do any of you know of any bar that would prevent GSA from offering such assistance to both camps? I know of no such bar. The uh, text we, of the statute, of course, says the terms president-elect and vice president-elect shall mean such persons as are the apparent successful candidates for the office of president, as ascertained by the administrator. But and the, ad the administrator is in the room, and we will, after those questions of Mr. Davis, why uh, we will get to that with the administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman from Virginia, no, Mr. Th Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, again, I guess you could give it to both. Uh, so you could probably give it to both and come back to Congress. We're still in session. I'm sure we would make it to work. I'm concerned that the fact that the funds haven't been transferred, that they're out in a fundraising mode trying to get money up and uh, to, to get the transition working smoothly. And I think that's going to have an effect in the early days of a new administration. Uh, what is your judgment on the impact uh, for the delay in releasing transition funds have in the new administration? Anyone want to hit that? Mr. Well, I go back to what I said originally, yeah. Mr. Davis. Uh, I think it's a very nonlinear effect. One, this is quality time for transition. You can focus on it. You can do the background work. Uh, you are not burdened by the responsibility of administering under the duties that you will eventually get after January 20th. And so there is a very disproportionate nonlinear impact. Uh, my guess is that if you lose a month in transition, it will delay uh, you being up and running uh, by about six months in the process. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Davis, again, not being part of any of the current transitions, I can't give sworn testimony as to what they are or are not doing. Based on what I read and understand about both the efforts of Governor Bush and Secretary Cheney and Vice President Gore and Senator Lieberman, they are underway informally with the kinds of efforts that they need to have underway to vet their appointments, make their appointment decisions, and so forth. So I. And indeed, I think I saw that Secretary Cheney has established offices in Virginia uh, for that purposes temporarily. The, so I think that we should not assume here, because I do, not, I do not think it would be practical or realistic to assume that nothing's being done right now in these two camps. I think a great deal is being done, point number one. Point number two, 
I agree with John Sununu that the other thing we need to keep in mind is that this is going to be decided very shortly so that the period of time that we are now dealing with in terms of selection of who the winning candidates are here is a very short window. We're not talking about another month. No, but we've lost a month. We've and, lost a month, but we, can't do, but we can't do anything about that lost month at this, at this point. It's lost, and so the question is, what can we do prospectively? Yeah, well, you still have, you just worry about get bringing people on and who you can hire and having to raise it. It just seems to me these are distractions that, it's on the margins, but it didn't have to happen. And uh, Mr. Rossi suggested maybe you go a little bit to both sides and you come back and have uh, uh, Congress fill it up. These are really small amounts in the scheme of things so that the new administration can get up and operating uh, on a timely manner as quickly as we can. Um, Mr. Davis, if I might, uh, I share Jack's view that um, this is time that has been lost, certainly. Uh, but I believe, as Mr. Light will tell you, uh, from the Brookings Institution, long before the election, uh, they had had a whole project, the Presidential Appointee Initiative, a bipartisan effort. And estimated at that time, even with a full transition, even with a landslide election that could have occurred, that it would have been October in the year 2001 before all presidential appointees were at their desk. That was their estimation, sure. either party. Sure. It, it underscores what I, I tried to present in my testimony, the need for reform. This month is lost. Uh, I think the president-elect uh, can go forward with it. But hopefully the kind of streamlining reforms that could be put into place will be prospectively helpful. Let me just ask you, do you think that Congress ought to do anything, uh, instead of putting the burden on the GSA administrator, that we could do something legislatively uh, to define an apparent winner, a certification or, so, or something like that? Is there any, any particular language anyone would suggest? I have, a, I have a strong view on that, Mr. Davis. I would love to hear it. It is that our judicial process has before it now the election contest issues which the parties have a legal right to have before Absolutely. them. And it would be my respectful, my most respectful but firm view that neither the legislative branch nor the executive branch should interfere with the proper functioning of the judicial process in this situation. Let that process work and run its course as it is about to do without interference. Well, let me, let me follow up. What, what if the election were clearly, you had an electoral vote that was clearly going to the House? Okay, and this, this were, under those circumstances here, you couldn't release anything to anybody until the election went to the House of Representatives in January where you'd probably be better off giving money to each side to at least plan. Yes, and that's, that's why I think we are unanimous in our view on this panel that everything as an informal and practical matter that can be done to share information and make these, make right. these people, both sides, both groups of people, prepare, uh, facilitate, right. and expedite their preparation should be done. Okay, thank you very much. I, I might add to that question that uh, just some figures uh, we have it easy if we want to pursue that because the vice president, uh, it would be part of the 1.8 million we have designated for the president and the vice president, the outgoing administration. That would be, according to the Congressional Research Service, our fine aim and support staff is $305,000 if uh, Mr. Gore was uh, made president, that money would revert to the Treasury because he's not leaving. But uh, I think it's pretty simple, and the, the principal witness will be, good, I'm sure, uh, helping us with some of the figures, and that's the next panel with the administrator of the General Services Administration. But that's not a, that is a solvable problem, and it makes it easy because nobody's losing anything. The, the vice president at that point, uh, this is coming out. But our, the concern most of us have is, good heavens, can't we get some money to them so they don't have to go pot in hand, which I think was pointed out is not a good thing to be doing because somebody will make a lot of hubbub about it. And uh, we ought to at least give them some decent uh, uh, planning space and communications and so forth so they can do some of the things that all of you so eloquently have noted. Well, gentlemen, I have uh, no more questions, and I don't think my colleagues do. No, 
and uh, we thank you very much for sharing your experience. And I must say, Mr. McPherson, I enjoy C-SPAN on Saturday afternoon when it tells me all about Lyndon Johnson's phones <laughs> and uh, who he's talking to. And as you say, he hit the ones that liked him and the ones that didn't like him. But he was a dynamic president. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mr. you all thank for you, coming. Thanks. We now call forward the second panel. And the second panel will be the Administrator of General Services Administration, Mr. Barham, uh, Ms. Katzen, Deputy Director for Management, and, uh, uh, Stuart Garson, Green, Paul Light, Director, Center for Public Service at Brookings, uh, Jonathan Turley, Shapiro Professor of Public Interest Law at the George Washington University School of Law, uh, Todd Zawicki, Associate Professor of Law, George Mason University School of Law, Norman Ornstein, Resident Scholar, American Enterprise Institute for Policy Research, and we will close with Honorable Dwight Inc., President Emeritus, Institute of Public Administration. He's probably served more presidents than everybody else uh, put together, but we got everybody behind the right sign, and we'll administer the oath then we've got everybody there and if anybody's going to be uh, for those in the administration assisting it please have them uh, take their hand so the clerk can note uh, if you're dependent on any aides we don't want to have to uh, give the oath in the middle of the hearing so if you've got people that are going to give you information for the record let's have them <coughs> back of you i don't see any so we will deal strictly with the witnesses that are listed. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Clerk will note that all <coughs> witnesses have affirmed or sworn. Now, we now get the, the star witness, and he's at the edge of the table, but we've Maybe that's because the door's closed, but uh, anyhow, we have a very distinguished member. He's been very helpful to this uh, committee and Congress in the years we've been here, and that's the Honorable David Barham, Administrator of General Services Administration. And this, uh, they have a fine job they do during the year, and uh, this one probably surprises GSA administrators to get into it, but uh, Congress thought that that would be sort of a neutral way, and they were in charge of getting all those fine things like space and uh, documents and all the rest in, uh, in collusion, we'll say, with the National Archives, which uh, we now uh, turn to Mr. Barham, and uh, we're delighted to have him, and uh, please uh, proceed. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, as I have said many times to you and, and anybody who will listen, this is not your father's GSA and never has it been so profoundly you know, interesting as it is right now. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to talk about the Im implementation of the Presidential Transition Act and how GSA plans to assist in an orderly presidential transition of 2000-2001. Uh, and by the way, I'd like to put into the record and make sure it gets in the record a, a um, an opinion by the Department of Justice about uh, whether we can have two, whether we can fund two candidates, and their answer is no. Uh, although, like any, I think a lot of people, it would be nice if we thought the law would work to do that for the reasons you said. But anyway, under the uh, Presidential Transition Act of 1963, as amended, GSA is the provider of a fully equipped headquarters and a variety of services for the President elect's transition team. Most of the facilities and services we provide to the president-elect and his transition team are generally the same as we provide to all our customers, office space, telecommunications, IT services and equipment, and furnishing supplies and other things they need to do their jobs. Because GSA is the custodian of federal transition funds, we also serve as the financial advisor, accountant, and payroll office for the transition. Under the Presidential Transition Act of 2000, GSA was given two new responsibilities. The first is coordinating orientation activities for high-level nominees and appointees. The second is to work with the National Archives and Records Administration and others on a transition directory.
Congress has appropriated $5.27 million for the 2000-2001 incoming transition to pay for those services and facilities, as well as compensation for transition staff. One million of that will pay for the orientation activities and directory. In order to facilitate an orderly transition, we have been working with both campaigns since August, and we continue to do so on a daily basis. We have leased office space, provided security for it, fully furnished and equipped it, and arranged for telecommunications and information technology services to begin as soon as the president-elect is apparent. We have begun planning the orientation activities and, are prepared and, ha and have prepared a working draft of the transition directory. The Presidential Transition Act of 1963 makes it my responsibility to ascertain the apparent successful candidates for president and vice president before the funds, services, and facilities authorized by the act become available to the transition team. While the act gives no explicit criteria or deadlines for making this ascertainment, as the legislative history demonstrates, demonstrates, Congress made it perfectly clear that if there is any question of who the winner is in a close contest, this determination should not be made. As Representative Fessel explained during the 1963 discussion of the bill, quote, in a close contest, the administrator simply would not make the decision. Representative Fassell went on to explain that there is nothing in the act that requires the administrator to make a decision which is, in his own judgment, he could not make. If he could not determine the apparent successful candidate, he would not authorize the expenditure of funds to anyone, and he should not. A few people have speculated about how I could have decided or about whether the GSA administrator is the right official, but the law seems quite clear to me. Under the Presidential Transition Act, GSA has no role in determining who the next president will be or affecting the contest for the presidency. The law does not authorize me to pick the next president or predict who the next president will be. Instead, the law creates a simple, common-sense requirement for me to identify the president-elect after it is clear that one candidate has won the election. In this unprecedented, incredibly close, and intensely contested election, with legal action being pursued by both sides, it is not apparent to me who the winner is. That is why I have not ascertained a president-elect. In extremely close elections, state laws provide for various means to ensure that, that the results are correct. The country is going through that process now. I don't intend to predict when it will be apparent who the winner is, but I am confident that we will all know and probably all agree when their winner is apparent. Both candidates are honorable men, and each is convinced that he has won this extremely close race. I intend to respect the integrity of their public statements. During the last three weeks, our American political system has faced a huge test. In my view, our system, as usual, is working. We Americans trust each other enough to believe we can get through this challenge. Because the president-elect will have a shortened transition period, we at GSA have been working diligently to give the transition team the tools it needs for a smooth transition. We continue to work closely with both campaigns to shorten the turnover time so that what once took a week or more can now be done in a day or within hours. We've talked with both campaigns before the election to ensure that we were setting up the space and systems so that, that they could use them productively. In the last few days, we have suggested additional steps to speed the turnover, such things as creating local area network and email accounts and passwords, providing their staffs with remote access to the transition, internet intranet, preparing financial and contractual documents for goods and services their teams will need, even ordering stationery. We are acting professionally and with no bias toward either candidate, as we have been since August and will continue to do. With so many rapid technological changes, I think this may be actually the last transition where the transition team will need 90,000 square feet of office space and 500 computers in one location in Washington, D.C. For example, staff of both campaigns are already linked in virtual space. Compare this to the last transition in which laptops were invisible and wireless technology barely existed. We already see that many of the administrative paper-based transactions of 1992 will now be done electronically, saving time and money for the taxpayers. We think that the preparations GSA has already made, including taking advantage of technology, will help make the 2000-2001 tra transition, though smooth, short, 
a smooth transition. Thank you. We thank you. Uh, before we go to questions, I'd like to hear from uh, Ms. Katzen, uh, the Deputy Director for Management of the Office of Management and Budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here to testify about OMB's implementation of the Presidential Transition Act. Now, given the events since November 7, 2000, we do not know who the next president will be. Nonetheless, much work has already been done, and we are ready to ensure that a true smooth transition from this administration to the president-elect, whoever that may be, will in fact occur. Now, the Presidential Transition Act of 1963, as amended, provides for an efficient transfer of authority from one administration to the next, and it outlines specific roles for a number of federal agencies, including GSA, the Office of Personnel Management, the Office of Presidential Personnel, and the U.S. Archivist. OMB does not have a specific role outlined in the Act. Nonetheless, we have been doing our part to assist in the transition process. As you know, OMB was instrumental in obtaining funding for the presidential transition, and specifically in helping to secure funding in the continuing resolution so that funding would be available. Funding could, was in fact appropriated for the incoming administration. The $5.3 million in funds that was provided for the incoming president was apportioned by OMB and is available for GSA to release when the administrator determines that the statutory test has been satisfied. In addition, OMB, like every other federal agency, is doing everything it can, preparing briefing materials on the organization, function, and duties of the organization that were referred to by the previous panel, that will assist the president-elect and his staff. We are preparing to share that material with the next OMB director or other appropriate representatives of a president-elect. And the delay in identifying a president-elect has absolutely not affected our work in this area. As you know, the bulk of OMB staff are career professionals whose mission is to serve the presidency and the nation, not any individual president. Our senior career staff is actively working with OMB leadership to prepare for the transition the expertise and institutional memory of OMB's career staff will be invaluable to the next president, regardless of which candidate ultimately is inaugurated. In addition, several weeks ago, OMB began work on an executive order that the president issued on November 27, 2000, creating a transition coordinating council. OMB director Jacob J. Liu is OMB's representative and member of the council. The Council will provide the President-elect's team with coordinated services and will ensure that we are prepared as we can be for an orderly transition to the new administration. Specifically, the Council will oversee the transition activities of the agencies and departments and direct that training materials and orientation sessions be prepared for appointees nominated by the President-elect. In addition, the work of the Council will memorialize the process under which the President's appointees and the President-elect's appointees will collaborate during the transition process. The administration is seeking to do whatever we can in the way of providing transition assistance on a parallel basis to both candidates. We at OMB are prepared to do our part in that process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank you very much. And before we go down the line, and I know you all have excellent ideas, I'm going to stop here for some questions uh, on the first two administration officials, and I want to put into the record a, uh, a, a uh, memorandum for heads of executive departments and agencies from John Podesta, Chief of Staff, <coughs> Presidential Transition Guidance, dated November 13, 2000. And uh, the, the administrator, I know, is well aware of it because everybody's asked him on that question. And uh, the, in Mr. Podesta's uh, memorandum, he 
which says, until a president-elect is clearly identified, therefore, no transition assistance as contemplated under the Transition Act is available. You may continue to provide the kind of information or assistance, if any, that you typically provide to presidential candidates and should continue to prepare for the transition so that we are able to provide full assistance quickly to the office of president-elect. Uh, that, uh, Mr. Barham, did that uh, memo of Mr. Podesta's uh, have any influence on your decision? No. And you stated a uh, legal opinion, and uh, I don't know if the staff and members have it. Do we have it? If so, we'd like a copy of it, and we'll get it so we can all see it. The legal opinion I mentioned was from was uh, from the uh, Department of Justice to Beth Nolan, the counsel of the president. Um, and it basically, it, it basically was around the question, of fundamentally, and maybe maybe other parts other parts in it, but fundamentally around the question that Mr. Osi raised about whether there could be money provided out of his funds for more than one candidate, and the the answer that their interpretation of the law is clearly no. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Gerson. Uh, I I've looked at this as a lawyer and as a, a denizen of the, of the former denizen of the Justice Department, and I believe the administrator is right. I remember an old contracts case in which uh, there were two ships called the Peerless. I don't think there can be uh, two apparent winners, and that's that's one of the things that I think uh, is implied by Mr. Osi's question, and that uh, you perhaps would like to address. I can speak about it later in, in my remarks. Well, it's that term. obviously, one of the uh, ways, if we don't have any more uh, signals along the way would be since the Clinton administration has funds uh, to, uh, uh, of $1.8 million to go out of the administration and uh, the offices they hold. And if the uh, vice president was the president-elect one way or the other, or possible president-elect, he, he would return the 305000 for the vice president's office in that to the Treasury. Now, obviously, one thought is, if he's already got 305000 no matter what he does, uh, would it not be possible to at least give 305000 or something in that range uh, to the uh, other contender for the presidency? What do you think of that? I, I, my guess is that the, the administrator would balk at it because uh, his entitle as he sees his entitlement, I, I think he's right, although we may disagree about, about uh, how he's exercised it. Uh, he is only entitled to uh, uh, make available the, the cash, space, and services to the apparent winner. Uh, the other part does take care of itself. You're, you're certainly correct about that. I think that's a matter that you want to address. I mean, had he, had he seen it another way, he, he, he likely could have done that with respect to, to, to Governor Bush, but I think he, he uh, it feels constrained. And I think the plain meaning of the statute constrains him from doing what is otherwise entirely reasonable. I'm told that the Supreme Court of the United States uh, has uh, held that the Florida Supreme Court had no justification for extending the vote count deadline. The case was remanded to the Florida Supreme Court to explain how they came to their decision. Is that a little roadstone along the way <laughs> that might get some money loose for the uh, possible but likely president-elect of the United States. Is that a rhetorical question? No, no <laughs> it, it's a question that uh, does that give you a little more of a signal? You know, I, I don't, I don't want to predict what, what how, how I could decide on the apparent winner. I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be that complicated, frankly, and I, there's a lot of things going on, and they'll, they'll certainly shake out. Nobody wants to have this prolonged any longer than necessary. Um, I, I don't want to say that's a, a little step or a big step, but obviously it's important. Yes, uh, um, Professor Twicky. A, a quick note, Section 4 of the original act says that for the outgoing president and vice president, that the funds uh, um, that, that, it's, that the administrator is authorized to provide upon request for a period not to exceed six months from the date of the expiration of his term. Um, 
if the expiration of the term is January 20th, uh, one would think that the outgoing funds would not be made available to the outgoing vice president until after that date. Yeah, it says uh, in section four, as you refer it to it, uh, that it shall not become effective with respect to a former president until six months after the expiration of his term as of office as president. I actually, I actually <coughs> think it might start 30 days in advance and proceed six months afterward. Well, any other questions, my colleagues, Mr. Turner, gentlemen, ranking member? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it may be is a good suggestion that we have heard made by some of the members of our committee. It would be nice if we could provide both uh, Vice President Gore and Governor Bush some assistance during this difficult period that we find ourselves in due to the legal proceedings surrounding the outcome of the election. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Barnum, I gather what you're telling us is that as you read the statute and as you've been advised by legal counsel, uh, you don't have the option of sharing the money between the two contenders. That is not an option even available or any way that could be construed from the reading of the act. That's correct. Regardless of what I really, what I personally like to see, that's the way I read the law. In fact, the, the language of the legislation itself actually defines for you uh, the and defines the terms president-elect and vice president-elect and I'm reading from the act here it says the terms president-elect and vice president-elect as used in this act shall mean such persons as are the apparent successful candidates for the office of president and vice president so you're trying to follow the statute and determine who is the apparent to all successful candidate, and as of yet, that does not seem to be uh, apparent uh, to any of us with the ongoing legal proceedings that have clouded the outcome of the election. Is that basically the position? Yes. Take? Yes. And it wouldn't even allow you under that language to say, I think it's probably going to be Vice President Gore, probably going to be Governor Bush, and therefore I'll go ahead and release funds. You know, I, I, um, I took an oath to well and faithfully exercise the responsibilities of the office, and I see it that way. And I know it's not popular with some people, and, and it makes some people nervous. It makes some people in GSA nervous. I don't want, if, if, if Governor Bush were to become the president, some people are wondering if he would take it out on him. And I, I don't see it that way. I think he's an honorable man. I um, take it out of me. That's what I, welcome to take it out of me, but uh, the, our, my agency has done a spectacular job of of putting together the, uh, the facilities, the capability, the resources, uh, so, and we are eager. Our people are eager for a president-elect to be a parent so that that person and his team can get working in our space. I noticed in your testimony before the committee, your written testimony, you actually went, had gone back and you cited in a footnote uh, the uh, debate on the act when it was originally passed in 1963 where uh, Mr. Fussell, the gentleman from Florida, was asked what happens if there's a close election. And uh, I noted that uh, when he responded to that inquiry um, about what would happen if you, you, you don't know who is the winner, he said it, it is an unlikely proposition, which I guess turned out to be false, because obviously we have that situation today, but he said it's a very unlikely proposition, but if it were to happen, and I'm reading from page uh, uh, 13349 of the Congressional Record in 1963, he said if it were to happen, if the administrator had any question in his mind, any question, he simply would not make any designation in order to make the services available as provided by the act. If, as an intelligent human being, and he has a doubt, he would not act until a decision has been made in the Electoral College or in the Congress. And as I recall, you actually cited that provision uh, in your testimony before I, this. I week. meant to cite the intelligent human being part. I don't know if I did. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing to me how Florida figures prominently again. 
You know, I, re I and I never thought it in my, when I came to Washington, I would be reading the congressional record in discussions between members 40 years ago. But I did read that and I was, some things never changed. The, the conversation was a lot about whether we should spend any money at all. And Representative Fassell was arguing for why this was a good idea and, and Mr. Uh, Gross from uh, Iowa was saying, you know, I don't think um, any of these candidates that I see coming on the scene in 1964 are gonna have any trouble buying their next sandwich. So why do we have to give them any money? I, things, are, things are funny how they go. They, don't, they seem not to change no matter how much time goes by. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome. I now uh, yield to the lawyers on our side and uh, that is the, the uh, vice chairman of the subcommittee, uh, Ms. Biggert, the gentlewoman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, the chairman referenced the, uh, the uh, memo from uh, John Podesta of November 13, 2000. Uh, do you know who, uh, uh, was that who he consulted with before that memo was issued? Who the chief of staff consulted with? No, didn't, no I do not know. Okay, but it was sent to all the executive agencies? Yes. And you received that? Yes. Did, um, and I know in your testimony you, you spoke about the, uh, the type of assistance that, um, that uh, GSA um, was providing to both the, the Bush and the Gore teams. Could you be a little bit more specific about what is actually being done right now? Well, um, we, have, we have had uh, extensive conversations. Uh, we have a, a, a woman named June Hu June Huber, who was our career a career executive who was leading the GSA transition activity. Um, she has been in constant contact with Clay Johnson and Roy Neal, other members of the two transition teams for a couple months, maybe three months now, to do a couple of things. One, to make sure that, that each of them, both of them would have the kind of productive workspace that they want. What, what would be most productive to them? So we've been working, talking with them about that. Well, one of the um, things that uh, Governor Sununu mentioned, that it's very hard when you, you don't have the keys to the office and you don't have the space and you have to uh, you know, maybe go from lawyer office to lawyer office. So there really is no physical space, is there, that, that these transition teams could have? There's, there's no government provided transition space. Do you know, are you aware that they have a transition space where this is accomplished then if you've been meeting with these people? You mean the space in Virginia that, mm -hmm. yes, I'm aware they have uh, have some space, yes. Okay. Uh, well, could I, at that point, if I mm -hmm. might, uh, the space you were gonna give either one, I believe, is the one that the Y2K right. effort of Mr. Koskinen occurred. I was told by a reporter when he uh, leased that space that it was a $50 million operation. I said, you got to be kidding. Now, how long is that lease? Is anybody in it now? Nobody's in it now. And if it's empty, why couldn't we move people into it now? Because we aren't going to spend much money. I think you've already got a uh, lease with that building, I assume. Who does own the building? We, GSA has a lease for that, for that space, 90,000 square feet, uh, which we are planning to turn over to a transition team soon. Um, so, uh, and is your question why well, we- Well, what does what that 90,000 square feet cost? Uh, so I think it's seven, I think we're expecting $700,000 during the period of time. 700,000 over what period? Uh, I think it's till 30 days after, is that, that's correct. Till, till, so, till February 2019, 18, whatever. Well now, Y2K was over as of January of, uh, uh, 1999 going on 2000. Uh, what, uh, was that just a long-term lease, even though we didn't have any use for it? I, I don't, I don't no. think I know the answer to who, who, nobody was in that space for a period of time. I can tell you that the um, Y2K facility known as the ICC was used, the space, through at least late May, early June. There was the problem not only of the December 31st date change, but also concerns about what would happen with leap year 
And then there was some other problem that was uh, running around, uh, uh, the technical people were very concerned about. We started backing out of the space and moving things out, but I don't think it was until at least end of May, early June, that the Y2K piece relinquished control of that space. And then who was put in it? From, from May till now, I don't think anybody, we have a 10 year lease with that building, I'm told, and uh, we have, we have follow on tenants uh, in mind or set to go in there. So the lease is already being paid, yes, regardless of who's in it. So yes. conceivably, you could move at least one of the president elect, in quote, uh, that have come along and given them the space at a dollar a week or something. Because I think it's not very smart for anybody to be putting their hand out to have various people want influence and this kind of thing, because that's the way it'll look from yeah. some nitpicking, as Mr. Sanudin, who said, I think, or somebody yeah. said it, that a nitpicking member of the press might take it that way. Mr. Chairman, uh, can I yeah. just uh, interrupt for one yeah. second? Because I think that before the administrator <coughs> leaves, uh, I was handed a note that said that the Supreme Court has just ruled unanimously for Bush. Uh, and I thought that might be relevant. Your staff may want to confirm it before the administrator leaves to see how that would affect his decision uh, not to designate uh, President Bush as the president-elect. Mr. Chairman, if I might interject yeah. here. Um, we have not seen the decision yeah. from the Supreme Court, and I'm not quite sure it's fair to Mr. Barron to put him on that spot. Well, I didn't mean to put him on a spot, but I expect this is a contingency that he may have thought of. Uh, if it's true, I thought it'd be a relevant question. Mr. Chairman, could yeah. I reclaim Go my ahead. time? Go ahead. I apologize right. for taking so much of it. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Katzen uh, also about the, uh, the the detail of it, assistance, but do you know that the uh, whether John Podesta acted in consultation with the president? Uh, as far as his memo? I do not know. And Mr. Barham, Barham you don't know that no. either? Okay. Uh, could you then return to a little more specifics on the, the type of assistance uh, that is being given to the transition crews? There are, there are a lot of things that uh, any enterprise doing what they're going to do needs to deal with. How do you pay your people? Um, what kind of personnel services do you need? Um, how do you lay out space? Um, what kind of technology support do you need? Um, we could, for example, we could, the normal course of events would be for a tenant in, you know, to take, to go in, be, plan to go into a space and we would work with them to uh, lay out the space. And not, you know, doing it fast, it might take four or five, six days. What we've talked to both camps about is Let's talk about how you might want to configure it if you were going to go in tomorrow. So we're trying to do those kind of things in advance. We've talked to them about what kind of resume managing system would you like to have? How do you want your telephones to work? What kind of, you asked me for specifics, what kind of uh, domain name do you want on your email addresses so that we don't have to spend an hour or three hours or two days getting that simple thing fixed up? And that has nothing to do with ascertaining an apparent winner. It's just mechanical logistics stuff that we ought to do in advance. What about then uh, briefings, let's say on foreign affairs or uh, things that might be uh, have security uh, complications? Is, well, is this part of your this, I, GSA's responsibility is to prepare the space, provide the support. Uh, those kind of things you talked about are the, are the purview of the relevant governmental agency. Well, are you aware um, of what the other federal agencies are doing then in this in this context? Well, I know that I'm aware that they're doing it. I, don't, I couldn't give you specifics about what each agency is doing. I know that we at GSA have prepared a very uh, extensive briefing book. Um, we think we can tell our story to the people who want to know very, very quickly and efficiently. And have those books been delivered to both? Uh, uh, the books are the books are haven't been delivered yet. So they're waiting uh, really until there is an appearance. You're waiting until there is an appearance. And yes. So really, the only thing that has been done is what? Well, I, I've 
tried to explain all the things that we have done in preparation for we've got the we have the building space ready we have all we have worked very hard on the but there's been no actual con contact where you've actually sat down with with the teams it's just I don't want to I don't want to say no to that because we have spent a lot of time with the teams but I think your question is have you started on the briefings with those teams and I don't I believe the answer is no and Ms. Mrs. Katzen you would say the same thing as far as what well I doing. would I would make one um, I guess two different uh, comments first with respect to national security uh, immediately after the convention uh, arrangements were made to have national security briefings of both candidates and the question of whether that was sufficient was raised I think by Mr. Card and in a uh, conversation with Mr. Podesta uh, and the uh, press secretary Jake Seward announced a couple of days ago the end of last week that they were prepared to provide um, more detailed national security briefings to both parties, uh, leading me to conclude that where there is a time-sensitive matter, requ matter requiring um, uh, immediate consultation, that we will be able to work our way through that. Um, so in, in response to your question, I do think on the national security front that more information is being shared with both uh, of the candidates. Uh, second is and that we have... Is, how is that being done? I don't know. It, it's national security. It would be handled probably through the national security advisor uh, who was responsible for the briefings of uh, both the governor and the vice president's uh, offices after the uh, convention. Um, but the details of that have not been shared with me. Uh, the second comment is that the OMB, B, OMB briefing books, which are quite voluminous uh, and hopefully will be very helpful. I took some comfort from the unanimity of opinion on the preceding panel that it was important for the new people to listen to um, the incumbents uh, as they described some of the problems that they had faced and some of the solutions they had thought of and, and uh, were pursuing. But those books are in the final stages of preparation uh, and uh, we are prepared um, uh, to provide those uh, at the appropriate time. Um, my, my own experience with the 92-93 um, transition was that that kind of information wasn't really made available until late December uh, or early January actually uh, in some instances. But uh, I think it would be desirable if uh, in, in a perfect world for us to do it sooner rather than later. So the, the uh the kind of assistance or information that's given to presidential candidates uh, would not include these types of briefings since they have not been delivered. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank you. Before we leave that question that we posed and Ms. Biggert and I posed to Mr. Barrams, I did not have a chance as the other representative of the administration, Ms. Katzen. Uh, are you familiar with the November 13th uh, memorandum from Mr. Podesta? Yes. Did he consult you? No. Did the president consult you? No. Because uh, we're told that uh, both of them uh, consulted each other, as you would think. The president's chief of staff would certainly ask the president on a delicate thing, but you weren't one of them that was consulted on this. That's correct. Okay. Uh, because we're told that they all uh, down there uh, have uh, consulted on it. They just won't admit it. So I was curious, you know, neither one of you claimed that nobody asked you and you weren't consulted. I would have to say that uh, it is not customary for Mr. Podesta, the <laughs> chief of staff, to consult me uh, on uh, each of the memos that he sends to the agency heads. If it's a, um, and, and so I had not expected to be consulted on this document. Well, I would think that when you're talking presidential transition, that cuts across the whole board. It isn't just one or two. So, okay, we will now move to Mr. Yeah, sure. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Mr. Barham, I wanted Mr. to inquire as to one matter that 
caught my attention and had been mentioned yesterday, and that is uh, in 1988, the uh, Presidential Transitions Effectiveness Act, uh, which amended the original bill, required the disclosure of private contributions for purposes of transition. Prior to that time, there was no disclosure of any privately donated funds used by any president-elect or vice president-elect. And I, I noted that um, in an answer to a question propounded by the committee, you mentioned in passing that the Clinton administration actually expended $5.2 million in transition expenses from private sources, which were disclosed according to law. So I gather it's not all that unusual to have president-elects expended expending private funds during the transition period. Is that what I'm? Well, we have one case. You know, we've only had one really significant transition since '88. Eighty, I guess eighty. Yeah. Yeah. Eight, no, eight, eighty-nine. So in the in the in the Bush trend, in the uh, in the. From Reagan to Bush, there was a relatively small amount raised, I noted, and in the Clinton uh, transition, there was uh, five million, I forget the, whatever the number was I wrote in the, in the, uh, in the answer. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the sample. Now, does this include uh, expenses such as those raised for inaugural parties and those kind of things? Or are we strictly talking about transition? expenses as, as we've been talking about. I think they're transition only, but maybe somebody knows. Transition only. Well, Inaugural is another whole uh, kettle of fish. Before 1963, that's the way they raised money, was through private sources. However, that I think everybody agreed that that was not the desirable route to follow. And I can appreciate that. Now, in 92, when Clinton, uh, during the Clinton transition, uh, where we were expending, according to your numbers, 5.2 million in private funds. The uh, federal government had appropriated 3.5 million for that purpose. Uh, fortunately, we have increased that amount in the Presidential Transition Act appropriations effective for this year to 7.1 million. So at least we've doubled the amount that the federal government's willing to pay to assist in the transition. Uh, but obviously, when Clinton took office in 92, the 3.5 million must not have been enough to accomplish the, uh, and pay for the expenses of transition since uh, 5.2 million in additional donated funds came in to accomplish that task. I, I wasn't here. Uh, Mark, if Mark Guerin was still here, he might tell us what, uh, you know what they spent it on, how they, why they needed it, uh, but I can. Things are expensive, and there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California, Mr. Osi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to examine something here. Uh, Mr. Barrett, you said, or excuse me, I don't know if it was Ms. Katz or Mr. Barrett. One of you indicated that we've got a 10-year lease on 90,000 square feet, costing 50 million dollars. The lease space. I didn't say 50 million. No, I said that what a reporter told me when Mr. Koskinen had him in. Okay. That was the total cost for the entire operation, which included not only the space, but also all of the contracting, the fitting out, and all of the contractors who were hired to work for approximately six to nine months, if not a year, before the date changed. The whole um, ICC was estimated initially to be um, $50 million. It was not the space alone. Okay, so you had interior improvements, partitions, demountable, and otherwise put in there within the $50 million. The question I have is, this is finished space. I mean, it's carpet, walls, all the stuff. Yes, it, but you know, every time you change tenants, you change a, change a few things here and there. And in the case of the Y2K, there was a lot of equipment that was taken out, so there was, so there was, we had to redo some of the space. So, yeah, we've done a little bit of that. Have we done any of that since late May, early June? In the last, uh, in the days up to the election, we were getting that space fitted out. In anticipation of someone occupying yes. it. Okay. Now you have, so you've had the uh, space planning done. Well, we've had, there's two, there's two parts to space planning. 
We've had the big spaces available, but once a tenant wants to go in, he's going to want offices in a certain configuration and technology lines drawn a certain way. We've tried to anticipate as much of that as we can, make it simple, like we do in all, for all of our tenants, but there's still some of that work that has to be done. Have either of the campaigns given you any space planning parameters? We have talked with them. Let me just check. We don't. Only the basics, but not the details. And that's what we have been talking with them in the, even in the last week about can you be more specific so we can be ready to hit the ground with these things. This, this is the issue that I'm trying to get at, is even if once we determine who wins or who won, uh, then you have your space planning process. And from my experience, that can be rather lengthy. And then you have your construction period. Now, no. tell, tell me how that's going to work. I, I don't think, I, we have, tr we, you know, th these days with modular furniture and movable walls and if we have, we have uh, CAD systems that help us design space much faster, we think we can do this in a, in a very short period of time. I'm talking hours and days, not days and weeks. We're, this, okay. we sh this should not be a gate gating factor to somebody being efficient. We're, we're trying everything we can do to make sure that doesn't happen. That's what I was trying to get at. So I have another question, Mr. Chairman, if I might. I'm yes, looking certainly. at Mr. Turner referenced the act itself, and I asked this question earlier about a bar to who might be provided this assistance. And I'm looking at the act, and it's, I mean, I followed Mr. Turner when he read it, and he read it word for word. But there's nothing in here, uh, in fact, it's, it refers in the plural to the apparent successful candidates. That's Vice President and President. Yeah. That's why it's plural, I think. Yeah. Well, then it re refers in the plural to such persons as are the apparent successful candidates. And I suggest that within the body of the Congress, you might have some disagreement as to who are the successful candidates. But I'm just, tr I'm just trying to find a, a way that we can start the ball rolling for whomever wins. And with all due respect, I mean, I see Mr. Gerson <laughs> shaking his head and his large I wish you were right. I mean, I, I really do, because what you're suggesting is entirely reasonable. But what I think I heard the, uh, uh, the, the administrator say, and I believe if I've heard him correctly, he is correct, that the operative terms president-elect and vice president-elect are then defined as such persons as are the apparent successful candidates. That's the way that the statute reads. I, 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 let me say in saying that, I'm a textual literalist, uh, I, I believe in following the plain meaning. I think the uh, administrator could have come to a different decision. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I think uh, if you want to do the thing that you want to do, you can do one or both of two things. One, you can change the statute for the future, and two, uh, uh, the House can deal with it as a, as, a, as a special appropriations matter. It's still in session. Uh, but I think that uh, the, uh, even though we are on opposite sides of the track on much of this, uh, uh, the administrator's reading of the literal words of the statute is correct. I, as I say, I don't think he applied the term correctly, but uh, in, in that regard, persons means the president and vice president. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Mr. Chairman, if, if, when we get around to considering this, I would suggest that the word apparent offers the opportunity for an interpretation that would <laughs> allow at this, at this juncture, in a circumstance such as we uh, enjoy today, so to speak, it would allow the apparent candidates to have access to this space. I mean, I just, somehow or another, the business of the country has to be addressed. And this is, you know, if you want me to wordsmith, I'll wordsmith. <laughs> but this has to move. I mean, this is the United States of America we're talking about. And, uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm well, I agree I'm with you, as, especially when the space is already leased. There isn't an extension just for the president-elect <laughs> and vice president-elect. They've got the space. Well, I mean, if, if we so have, I'll go out there with my magic there. marker and I'll draw a line down the middle of the room and, you know, we can put one on one side and one on the other. I don't care, but somehow or another, we got to break this. In the British tradition of a shadow cabinet, we might even say. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. More questions from my colleagues before we move down the line with Mr. Gerson. We don't want to lose the precious talent we've got here. We might run through this several times in this next few decades. Uh, anything to add, Mr. Gerson? Not this time. Okay. 
All right, we'll start with Mr. Light then. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you meant in terms of additional comments oh, I'm sorry. as opposed. I, I would like to say something yeah, go if, ahead. I, if I could, because I'd, I'd like to address what, what I think were the, were the real questions. Let me, let me note at the outset two things. That there's a certain uh, symmetry in my following uh, Ms. Katzen. Uh, we have been opponents, we've been colleagues, uh, but at the end of all of this, uh, like uh, Mr. Osi's daughters, we will still be the same, we'll, we'll still be friends. Uh, and I say also that while I'm here as a, as a in a purely private capacity, uh, I know that the uh, Bush-Cheney uh, camp bears no ill will uh, to, to the administrator, whom they believe is trying his mightiest, given the way he, re he reviews the statute and, and is providing uh, substantial assistance within the bounds uh, 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 that he feels he can. Uh, so I, I want to I make that clear as well. Uh, He's, he's not on the spot. I think it's, 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 it's all of us. It's all of us who are. Uh, and while I respectfully disagree with him, I certainly think that he's acting honorably. Um, in, in sum, it, it's my view that this subcommittee likely will want to consider clarifying amendments uh, to the Act. Uh, I believe that the Act already provides the authority and the obligation uh, to the administrator to fund and support the transition to an administration led by Governor Bush. and. Uh, uh, Secretary Cheney, whom I believe are the apparent winners of the 2000 election. Uh, at the same time, given the, the vagaries of the statute and the dearth of definitional guidance that has been provided, it is understandable why the administrator has been reticent in committing to the expenditure of resources uh, at this time. Uh, we've learned a lot uh, in recent weeks that we didn't think we needed to know about uh, with, with regard to the, uh, uh, the conduct of, of, of elections and the very narrow question that brings this particular panel together uh, fits into that, uh, in, into that category. I would say, though, uh, at the outset that I think the questions addressed to the previous panel uh, are at least as important, perhaps more important, uh, with, with regard to the, the, the need for collegiality uh, in, in, in the actual transition. It was in this room uh, while I was serving uh, as the acting attorney general at the beginning of the Clinton administration that a now departed member of the Congress, he's still alive, but he's no longer a member of the Congress, said under the watchful eye of Mr. Brooks, with whom I actually had consulted on the issue uh, that, that this other fellow thought was so controversial, he said, I thought we had an election to get rid of people like that, Mr. Gerson, who still seems to think that he's, he's running something. Well, that aside, the, the, the need for collegiality between ingoing and outgoing administrations uh, uh, cannot be underestimated. At the same time, Though I think John Sununu is absolutely correct in saying you need the facilities in order in order to get it done too, uh, and, uh, and and I think that's an important issue. Uh, in all of the of the functions uh, that encompass a transition, and I've been involved in several on on either side as as the uh, as part of an incoming administration and part of an outgoing administration, and then sort of with my with my feet in both camps in in, in 1992 1993. It's readily apparent that the national interest is best served by a vigorous transition effort that begins early and allows an incoming administration to gain mastery of the activities of the governmental departments and to put in place competent individuals able to serve the public forcefully and properly starting on day one, the day that the administration formally takes office. The understanding of this need for promptness pervades the legislative history of the act and recent history has shown, especially where there is a change of governing political parties, that this is a matter of continuing uh, national importance. The Act defines the operative term president-elect and vice president-elect vice president as, as the apparent successful candidates. And here, Mr. Osi, I want to address in a different way, I think, the, the point that you very legitimately are trying to raise. The use of the conditional word apparent, as opposed to some other word, voted in by the Electoral College or, or something else, strongly suggests that the drafters of the statute knew that the administrator's determination could be upset by subsequent events, both related to the electoral process and otherwise. Given the use of that term in the statute, I suggest respectfully that the administrator could have determined that the Bush-Cheney ticket was the apparently successful, were the apparently successful contestants once the election returns in Florida were so certified by the Secretary of State of, of Florida. At that point, the ticket had apparently 271 uh, electoral votes, a, a majority sufficient to assure ultimate election. 
In declining to proclaim the success of the Republican ticket, the administrator has cited a number of things, one of which was the exchange that Mr. Turner pointed out uh, in his questioning between uh, uh, Mr. Fassell and, and, and his uh, interlocutor. Uh, these exchanges uh, exist, but that doesn't substitute for what actually gets written into a statute. And what the statute said is something that's conditional, that is subject to, to opinion and, and to uh, determination. Now, again, I respect the decision that the, uh, uh, that the administrator has made, while I might uh, disagree with it. Uh, and hence, uh, uh, I think that there are things that you might want to address. One is changing the nature of this altogether and uh, uh, creating a, a statute or changing the statute to the point that it can encompass the, the events that we have today, an election which to some is too close to call, which certainly has equivocal aspects to it, uh, uh, where it makes all the sense in the world for the very points that have been made since Lyndon Johnson himself uh, was the majority leader of the Senate and so spoke to this very bill uh, that uh, you, you need to get running early, quick and hard. Uh, and uh, that, that's one thing that, that you might wish to do. Uh, the second thing, of course, is to change the definition uh, to, to something clearer. And the third is to alter or remove this idea uh, that uh, there is discretion in the administrator that is otherwise unreviewable. Now, I don't know how a court would determine it. We've had too many lawsuits and nobody's suggesting that anybody sue anybody. Uh, but uh, there ought to be clearer guidance uh, and it ought to be clear that there is at least a potentially reviewable uh, external decision that would allow for the encompassing of the vagary of the term that the Congress itself chose, apparent, not absolute, not scientifically certain, clinically certain or anything else, but apparent. With that, I ask that my formal remarks be made part of the of the record and thank the, the chairman. Uh, I, I might say, and I should have, that uh, the minute we introduce you, your full remarks are automatically for all of you put in the record. Uh, what's concerned me on some of this is several weeks ago, uh, after the election, that and after uh, a number of states uh, did uh, get uh, most of their ballots through the system, the uh, Mr. Card, the designated chief of staff by Governor Bush, phoned the White House and never got any answers for a long time. Now apparently that's changed. But what worries me is, you know, are they just trying to make life tough for their uh, successor? It seems to me when they raised five million or so back in 93 uh, to do a lot of this, and uh, they uh, certainly ought to know what the problems are. And I would think that uh, they would try to get a lawyer that put a broad stretch to this law. It might not be as clear as it should be, but just say, hey, let's, let's give them the space. Ms. Katzen is, is, is from OMB, and, and uh, she knows more uh, about the expenditure of public funds than I do, but there are other, I mean, conceivably, if you're looking to uh, push the envelope a little bit, uh, that might relate to the ability, for example, of GSA to lease the space at a, at a marginal rate given the, the real estate realities that two or three members of the, of the subcommittee have already pointed out. I mean, there may be other ways to address it. I want to be clear that what I'm addressing is this statute. Uh, and I, and I, think it has pro I think it does have problems in it. We're, exper we're, we're experiencing those problems. That's not to say that there are not uh, uh, some uh, uh, interstitial solutions uh, that might practically be available, the press and other inquirers notwithstanding. I think we all know how the, how the public interest best would be served, and that would be to provide as much information to whomever might be the uh, incoming administration as is as, as, as usefully possible to do. Right. Mr. Horn, I, I simply wanted to respond to the speculation that uh, there may be some thought uh, in the West Wing that we should make it more difficult for the incoming administration. Um, and I have to unequivocally and absolutely say that is not the case. The President made it very clear before the election that he wanted to make the transition as smooth, as helpful, as constructive as possible. You heard during the earlier panel discussions about there not being computers in the West Wing and in some of the other Executive Office of the President uh, facilities. You heard about a number of other things that did cause problems and the President was determined that this would be a constructive, 
helpful, supportive transition and, and any thought that any action that we are taking is designed to make it tough on the new guys is just not founded. Well, I'm sure they are when they work for you, but uh, there's a lot of people around this place, downtown. So uh, let's see, any other questions on this? Then we'll move to uh, Mr. Light. Oh, go ahead. <coughs> Gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Bigger. I'm sorry, one, one thing is that um, if, if either the, the Bush team or the Gore team uh, is using uh, their own finances to do this, and then a later uh, become the president-elect, will they be reimbursed for funds that have been uh, used, private funds that have been reimbur reimbursed? No, that the law, the law is, is, again, I think, clear that un you can't, until the administrator ascertains the apparent winner, money cannot be expended. So money spent before couldn't be. One of the things that I comfort myself with as a citizen is that uh, in, in lieu of the conversation earlier about how much money uh, the Bush team is going to raise and the Gore team would raise, I imagine, to, uh, to supplement the, the amount of money that you've appropriated. Um, hopefully it'll, it'll settle out soon enough so that that money would get to be spent on the front half, and we'll see. Do you, would you recommend uh, clarifying that law, or do you think oh. that it's proper the way it is? Sure. I, to me, if you want my personal opinion, I, I'm not hung up on the, on the, 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 the ability of the administrator to make an a ascertain an apparent winner. Uh, I think the real, real serious issue in America is the kind of voting machines that we have. So that's that's something to worry about. Uh, I would also be happy if if um, we were if the Congress were to tackle the question that Mr. Osi was raising and others that. Uh, May there ought to be a way to split this money and have enough available in this unusual circumstance. I, you know, Representative Fasol is right. It's, it's unusual for this to happen. It isn't going to happen that many more times. So you don't want to. I don't think you have to burden yourself with thinking if we had t t twice as much available in this kind of a situation that we're going to be breaking the republic. Uh, it's not going to happen that way. I just think the law makes it impossible for me to do anything that, to use Mr. Gerson's words, would be common sense. Okay. Thank you. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. <laughs> Thank you very much. We now get to Paul Lout, uh, Paul Light, uh, Director. <coughs> I'm sorry, was there a question? Center for Public Service at the Brookings Institution. Mr. Light uh, is probably one of the finest commentators on the executive branch in the country. So we look for your wisdom. Well, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to say uh, right off the bat that uh, we're now looking at another statute that I encountered early in career and worked on as a staff member of the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee. Uh, Mr. Mr. I don't Chairman, remember looking at this apparent, Mr. Light, uh, can you move that microphone closer, please? Sure. Well, and make sure it's. I guess we're now on. I guess I was saying that uh, this is another statute that I worked on earlier in career as a staffer for Senate Governmental Affairs and. I don't recall ever having looked at the apparent uh, successful candidates problem. We didn't think it would come up. We didn't focus attention on it at all. We embedded in the 1988 Presidential Transitions Effect Effectiveness Act disclosure requirements uh, as a condition of taking transition funds. The president-elect uh, and vice president-elect would agree to disclose uh, the sources and purposes of their private fundraising. And luckily, uh, Governor Bush and, vice, uh, and Secretary Cheney have agreed to disclose uh, even though they don't have to. Um, I should acknowledge at the very beginning here that we wouldn't be arguing so much about uh, the value of this space uh, for the transition if GSA hadn't done such a terrific job in developing and preparing this space. If this space were down at the Navy Yard and uh, it hadn't been uh, done so well, I'm, I'm suspecting that we might have a transition elsewhere anyway. June Huber and her staff have done a terrific job and the administrators to be congratulated for his leadership in uh, pushing the agency to be prepared on time. Um, I should say that, you know, in 1988, when we did have the Transitions Effectiveness Act hearings, Dante Fassell did testify. His testimony uh, showed the, the primary purposes of the 1963 Act, again, to be that uh, we have a prompt start to the transition, that we move quickly, 
uh, to provide the president and vice president-elect uh, access to uh, resources that could help them get a hold of government. It was also designed to drive private funding out of the transition uh, business. Uh, the authors of the 1963 Act worried about the amounts of private fundraising going on, and they thought it was untoward that the president-elect should be in that business. Uh, I do not believe we are yet at a crisis point in the transition. Uh, we would have spent the last three weeks uh, doing uh, the enrollments, getting things set up, uh, picking the cabinet members, but we are reaching the point of crisis. And I believe within the next half week to week and a half, uh, we are at a point where action to uh, basically uh, define the apparent successful candidates uh, will be needed if we're to have a successful transition and a successful first year in government. I should say that, that our primary concern at the Brookings Institution and at the Presidential Appointee Initiative, which is housed at Brookings, is the appointments process that delays currently in the uh, uh, startup of the transition have a multiplier effect further on down the line. Uh, there will be no difficulty here with the President-elect, uh, Vice President-elect, uh, uh, nominating and securing the confirmation of their cabinet secretaries and senior most officers. That's not the problem. The problem is not at the very top of the federal government in terms of the appointments process. The problem is at the second, third, fourth, and fifth vertebrae of the federal hierarchy where you have an onslaught of positions that you need to fill in order to take firm hold of the federal establishment. That's the deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, and administrators who occupy the neck of the federal government. As I've said elsewhere, we are at risk not of having, having a headless federal government next year, but a neckless federal government, meaning that we won't have the connections between the leadership of the federal hierarchy uh, and the career workforce. And I think that is a serious problem which should motivate us as we try to resolve this dispute. In my testimony, I take a look at the legislative record. I am not a legal scholar, I'm a legislative scholar. My reading of the record is that the administrator could have made two choices uh, last week, both of which would have been fine. He could have made the decision to allow the transition to begin. I believe that he had the statutory authority to do so, and I believe there's embedded in the statute and in the record uh, appropriate support for deciding that there was apparent, that there were apparent successful candidates that he could let the transition begin. I also believe that he could have denied uh, the transition funding as he did, but not for the reasons uh, that have been embedded in the ongoing conversation of these last few days. I do not believe it is an appropriate reason for denying transition support uh, that we just have a close election. For in fact, the, found, the drafters of the statute had just been through one of the closest elections in American history, and Dante Fassell, every time uh, the discussion turned to the issue of doubt about close elections, when the uh, conversation uh, turned to the issue of allowing the administrator authority uh, when he had a doubt to say no. Uh, Dante Fassell talked about the fact that there had only been three close elections in American in the whole of American history. And I believe by that statement, uh, the representative from Florida qualified uh, the authority to deny funding in close elections. Closeness by itself did not create the presence of a demand that you not release the transition funds. It was closeness of a type. Um, I believe the administrator does have the authority to, to deny transition funds in a close election, but he needs to make painfully clear exactly what the conditions are in a way that does not allow future losing candidates to deny the transition funds by merely contesting an election. That's not to say that the Gore contest is uh, ill-founded. It's to say that we need a definition of apparent successful candidates that does not put the power in the hands of the losing candidate to deny the beginning of a transition that the drafters of this bill felt was so important to taking hold of government. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. I was just reading Mr. Fassell's testimony or his uh, debate remarks in the debate as you were uh, referring to him there, and I may have missed a little bit of what you said, but it did strike me in reading the full description of the debate that one of the issues that was uh, discussed in some detail was the concept raised by Congressman Haley that, in fact, 
that under the Constitution, the president-elect and vice president-elect are determined officially after the electoral votes are counted uh, in the Congress. And so it seems to me that one of the purposes of the 63 legislation was to enable someone who was the apparent winner to begin to receive funds prior to that date. Uh, but it does also seem logical to assume that the use of the word apparent was designed to remedy what would otherwise be a problem if we said that we're going to provide transition funds to the president-elect, who is in fact only determined when the electoral votes are counted by the Congress. So, uh, and I read the reference that was mentioned with regard to there being uh, only three close election situations uh, that you referred to, but it was only a sentence after that where Mr. Purcell made the statement that I read earlier, which he said if that were to happen, if the administrator had any question in his mind, he simply would not make any designation in order to make the services available as provided by the act. If as an intelligent human being, and he has a doubt, he would not act until a decision has been made in the Electoral College mm -hmm. or in the Congress. Um, in another section of that debate, uh, the question is raised, which perhaps is the question that we haven't talked about here, but is so obviously apparent when Congressman Haley said, and if there is any doubt in the, his mind, the administrator's mind, and if he cannot uh, and does not designate the apparently successful cap candidate, then the act is inoperative. He cannot do anything, and there will be no services provided, no money expended. And Mr. Purcell says, certainly. Um, Mr. Gross, in this debate, asked the question, which I think is perhaps on all of our minds. He says, does not the gentleman, referring to Mr. Purcell, think that those designated as president and vice president by the present administrator of general services would be given a psychological or other advantages by designating them as president and vice president. Mr. Purcell says, I do not think so, because if they were unable at the time to determine the successful candidates, the act would not be operative. Therefore, in a close contest, the administrator simply would not make the decision. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seemed just from reading the totality of the testimony that what the words apparent president-elect meant was that uh, it would be apparent to one of common intelligence as to who the winner is. And if there was any doubt in the mind of the administrator where there is discretion placed, then he would simply not make the decision. Now, that may not be the best outcome, and I certainly agree with my colleagues who suggested that perhaps we ought to look at amending the act to allow some funds to flow to both candidates in this very difficult circumstance. But I I certainly can understand where Mr. Barham came up with his conclusion uh, not to expend public funds in a circumstance as clear as this bill seems to be uh, to me. Thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. I wish that uh, Representative Fussell had not, after saying these things, said that there were only three such situations in history because that then tempers his broad um, grant. Now, it's a thin brew where we're... Uh, dealing with here in legislative history. I mean, we're, we don't have anything in the uh, legislative record, really, the, the uh, Senate and House reports that accompanied this legislation to really give clarity here. All I suggest is that the administrator needs to, to come forward and say one of the following two things. He needs to say, look, the election of 2000 is like the elections of 1800, 1824, or 1876 in the following ways and therefore meets the test of, a, uh, of one of the such close elections as Representative Fussell said, or it's unlike the very close election of 1960 in which Jack Kennedy won the presidency by 114,000 votes, or it's unlike the election of 1870, uh, 1888 in which we had a popular vote winner who lost the electoral college. That's all the administrator need do. Um, the problem for Congress being that it's likely the administrator would end up saying, the reason why it's like this, uh, you know, why we can declare this a close election, uh, as Fussell, Representative Fussell said, is that the loser has filed a challenge. 
And that puts the power in, or the apparent losing candidate, or the possibly losing candidate, or that somebody has filed a contest. And you end up putting the power then in the hands of the person who may not be the winner to deny the transition funds. And I think you need to legislate on that so that in the future, we don't create a situation where people who are behind by a very large uh, uh, distance don't try to tie up the transition in an unfair or frivolous way. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I might uh, say, just for the record, to put in the word apparent from Random House, unabridged dictionary, second edition, 1993. And uh, that's about when you came to town, Mr. Administrator. And uh, I'm going to give you this and see if you can find the way to, now that we have a court decision, that uh, this uh, f fine facilities, which GSA has and has a lease on and is there, uh, could be utilized. So uh, s put that in the record uh, without objection and then give it to the administrator. It seemed to me you'd, uh, I, I know you're uh, leaving the GSA and those were long plans that you had, but, and we wish you well on that. Uh, so uh, don't go the too sooner far. The sooner the better, is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you could make a lot of people happy if you just said, hey, a new factor has been in and we ought to get this going. Because otherwise, we are going to be in a mess if we have to wait till the, of course, the Electoral College is coming up, and that's certainly a major step in the road. But. Uh, I just make that as a suggestion because there's got to be lawyers in the administration that say yes, because they've sure said yes to a lot of things. And there are also the no types in the lawyers, and you know that. So we need a yes lawyer as opposed to a no lawyer. And uh, anyhow, Mr. Light, Are you I'm suggesting gonna, a no lawyer policy? I, I have long ago suggested <laughs> that one, but I'm being delicate this morning. All right. So, uh, Mr. Light, we appreciate uh, all your thoughts on this. Uh, Mr. Turley has to leave here, uh, and I want to get him in before uh, the last three witnesses. So, Mr. Turley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Forgive, I usually have a light phone, but I appreciate uh, Put the you. microphone oh. a little closer. And uh, Mr. Turley is the Shapiro Professor of Public Interest Law at the George Washington University School of Law. I appreciate the indulgence of the committee and the indulgence of my co-panelists in allowing me to go out of order. Uh, I, I'm sorry that I have to leave um, the hearing. But um, I'm very honored to have the chance to speak to you about this subject. Uh, it's a subject, obviously, of considerable importance. I'd like to start out by saying, as with many of the people at this table, I don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, I, I do have a considerable academic interest in its outcome. I. In light of its, the concern about its outcome, I should note that I have the opinion of the Supreme Court here, which was faxed to me during these proceedings. Uh, the Supreme Court indeed did unanimously uh, rule in favor of uh, Governor Bush in the sense that it has reversed and sent this issue back to the Florida Supreme Court. That ruling was very narrow, and it turns on the lack of clarity as to whether there's a federal question in this issue. So it will be sent back to the Florida Supreme Court for a determination on that question. <coughs> what that means is that doubt will be prolonged as to who is the rightful president of the United States. Now, there's been great, there's been great discussion about the transition to the presidency. And I think that we're at a point today where we have to speak frankly on that subject. When we had our first transition in 1791 from George Washington to John Adams, the transition was a relatively modest affair. In 1800, there were less than 4,000 people in the executive branch. Today, there's almost 6,000 people in the White House alone. There's over 3 million civilian employees, and there's 140 agencies. The incoming president has 11 weeks to try to fill the necessary vacancies to carry out the mandate given to him uh, by the people. Governor Bush is at greater peril than Vice President Gore in this regard. Vice President Gore has the benefit of a continuity of policy and party. There are also great pressures upon uh, Governor Bush because of the concerns raised as to the need for reform, particularly when it comes to the White House. I have a recent article out uh, detailing the many issues for transition that have to be looked at for the White House alone. 
Those issues will stay in abeyance during this point of uh, uncertainty. And ultimately, we are left with the Presidential Transition Act of 1963 in the language of an apparent successful candidate. This act is extremely curious and is possibly the worst statute I have ever read in my life. I direct a legislative project, and if a student had handed me this statute, I would have sent the paper back without a grade in, 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 in deference to that student. This is bloody ridiculous to have a constitutional system that labors through checks and balances as to when we announce who the president is. We go through a bicameral process and various contingencies to guarantee in our system that these significant political questions are dealt with in the legislative branch. That's where James Madison wanted most things that divide us to be answered. But weeks before that decision is made in the Electoral College, an unknown federal official takes an intestinal check and determines whether he will announce one candidate is the apparent successor or another. I submit that's bloody ridiculous. I have no idea why the law was written this way, except that the law was written for extremely good constitutional weather and terrain. The, the, the amazing thing is we have a constitution that's built for the worst possible scenarios. It took Congress to write a statute to introduce a flaw into that system. And that's what the statute represents. I disagree to some extent with the, art, the statements made as to the interp proper interpretation of the statute. To me, I have great sympathy with the administrator. I expect that he probably would have liked guidance and he would like to do anything to have this cup pass from his lips. I also am sympathetic with this committee. This was not your drafting and you're dealing with a problem that you inherited. It's a problem I hope that you will solve. I have listed various possible changes that you can make in legislation to make this problem go away. But the reason the Supreme Court decision today is relevant is because the interpretation by the administrator leaves you with one obvious question. When do extrinsic actions or rulings get to the point that an administrator is satisfied as to the outcome? That's the problem here. Now, I don't know if the administrator is waiting for the Supreme Court. I expect that he wasn't because at issue in the Supreme Court is not a determinative question as to who is the President of the United States. I assume that he's not waiting for the ruling of a, a circuit court judge as to Leon County. And I assume he's not waiting for Seminole County. But that's the question. It's not clear what we're waiting for. And that's the flaw in the statute. What is clear is that our present status is wholly at odds with the intent of Congress. Congress wanted to avoid these 11 weeks being frittered away when we have very serious business uh, to get to. And it also wanted to avoid the need to raise private funds. We have now realized both of those dangers in this crisis. I agree that you cannot divide up the funds. This administrator does not have that authority given to him by Congress. If he makes the decision that he has made, it is not clear what the judicial review is. This is the first statute which I have searched to try to find a basis for judicial review. It's obvious that this would probably go to a fallback under the APA. But once you go to an APA review, I'm not too sure what the court would ask. Short of announcing that Ralph Nader is the President of the United States, I don't see much of a basis for a court to reverse a decision, even a bad one, by the administrator. The three suggestions that I have made, which I will just simply note, is first, this Congress should change the law so that the GSA administrator does not make this determination. The position of the administrator has no relevant constitutional or legal function. It should rest either in the Attorney General or a specially designed commission. Second, the Congress should lay out language that clearly sets forth how we deal with this type of controversy. It can do that in two ways. It can either allow for a dual track transition, which is an easy issue and would be cost efficient. That is the administrator in such circumstances as this could give initial funding to start the transition. And secondly, as an alternative, it could allow a candidate to spend private funds with the understanding that there is uh, a qualified indemnification provision so that if you are in fact successful in your challenge, the federal government will in fact pay for those costs. We have that already in some provisions dealing with litigation and executive branch officers. Either of those would make this very simple. And finally, the Congress needs to make these responsibilities mandatory and not discretionary. 
so that we have meaningful judicial review. I'm very encouraged that this committee on a bipartisan level has recognized that we are in a rather absurd situation. That absurdity can be rectified. But what I would suggest is that this is not a weakness in our constitutional process, which is remarkably strong. It's a weakness because we tried to improve upon it. We were acting in good faith, but we acted with the worst possible means. And I strongly encourage you to enact legislation to correct these problems. Mr. Turley, I'd be delighted to have any language you wish to submit. We won't grade it. Ah, I'd be delighted to submit it, sir. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Well, if you can get it to us this week, we're going to move on it or this next 24 hours. So we'd appreciate it. I will get it to you within a couple of days, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I know your colleagues uh, will uh, be uh, ending this up here. And our next speaker is Todd Zawicki, the Associate Professor of Law at George Mason University School of Law. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Distinguished representatives, it's a pleasure for me to be here to speak on the Presidential Transition Act of 1963. I'm just a law professor. I've never participated in a transition uh, like some of my colleagues have. And if the price tag is ten to sixty thousand uh, dollars, I doubt my wife will ever let me uh, undertake such a uh, uh, situation. So I'm going to just talk on the law, um, and as I interpret the Presidential Transition Act of 1963, unlike some of some of the other people who have spoken today, I don't see any ambiguity. Uh, in this act, I think that uh, it is my opinion that under the facts of the current situation, the administrator, administrator's refusal to release the transition resources to the Bush-Cheney transition team is inconsistent with the language, the policies, uh, and the scope of the discretion afforded the administrator under the act. We've heard reference to some of these things, but I think it's worth fleshing them out uh, to understand this. Uh, as you said, the plain language of the act is that the administrator is supposed to release the funds to the apparent successful candidates. Apparent successful candidate is not a defined term in the statute, uh, but there are some things that are clear from the statute and are clear from the uh, congressional debates surrounding the enactment of the statute. First, it is obvious that the mere fact that contingencies may intervene, that may mean that the apparent uh, candidate is not the actual winning candidate at the end of the day, does not change the fact that the apparent successful candidate is still the apparent successful candidate. The legislative history and debates are peppered with discussions about what happens, for instance, if you have faithless electors, electors who pledge to vote for one candidate and on the day uh, vote for another candidate. Does that undermine the fact that when they pledge to, be, uh, to elect the president that that is the apparent successful candidate? No, it does not. The fact that they may switch their vote does not undermine the fact that that is, in fact, an apparent successful candidate. Uh, as uh, uh, was discussed uh, during the debates, Congressman Fischel remarks on the, the close election point. <clears throat> the gentleman previously, this is quote, the gentleman previously pointed out in the last election we had one that was as close as we would want to have an election, and nobody had any trouble in deciding who is the apparent winner. During the 1960 election, of course, uh, my understanding is that Richard Nixon had litigation going in several states. Uh, I think I've read as many as 11 states after the election. Recounts were ongoing uh, for, for weeks, uh, if not months. Florida or Hawaii didn't complete their recount until late December. There was litigation and recounts ongoing for weeks after the 1960 election. And Congressman Fischel says nobody had any difficulty determining that John Kennedy was the apparent successful uh, winner in that election. Um, you can imagine all kinds of different contingencies that might arise in addition to recounts and litigation. You can imagine, uh, uh, as I said, court challenges, faithless electors, any variety of contingencies could, uh, could uh, intercede that would make it such that the apparent successful winner was not act, did not actually turn out to be the actual winner. Secondly, I think under functional interpretation of the policies, uh, I don't think we need to dwell on this, but it's obvious that, uh, uh, that the apparent successful uh, winner is, in fact, uh, the Bush-Cheney uh, team. There are two policies that are embedded in here. First is for an orderly and speedy transition. Second is to insulate the process from the appearance of impropriety uh, arising from having to rely solely on private funding. 
Uh, clearly, uh, as to the first one, an orderly and speedy transition, what this suggests is that there is a one-way street built into this uh, legislation that, uh, uh, that money can be replaced, time cannot. So that the idea is, is that there is a reason why we swiftly and promptly determine who the apparent successful candidate is uh, and release the money. Second uh, is uh, concerns about reliance on the private funds. My understanding is the Bush-Cheney team has uh, undergone heroic actions well exceeding what is uh, uh, provided for under the law in order to uh, 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 prevent that from happening, fr from actual influence uh, being a problem. But the perception is what the drafters were concerned of first. And secondly, they were concerned about the fundamental unfairness of this. This is a public, uh, this is a governmental function. They defined it as uh, the transition as a governmental function is simply unfair and inappropriate to have that be held hostage purely to private funds. So what this all means is that if you look at the uh, uh, legislative history and the plain language, it is clear that what they have in mind is a, a, a majority of pledged or certified electors is sufficient to and mandatorily triggers the, the, uh, um, uh, the apparent successful candidate provisions of the, of the statute, and the fact that that might later be reversed does not change that result. Finally, there's been question about the uh, scope of the administrator's discretion. I think that if you read the statute in its full context and the legislative history, it is clear that what we are talking about is very, very narrow, narrowly subscribed and limited discretion to make a predicate factual finding that one candidate is the apparent successful candidate. Under standard, this isn't a court of law, but under standard legal principles, um, a factual finding of that sort must be supported by substantial evidence. There is really no substantial, there is certainly no substantial evidence that anybody other than Governor Bush is the, uh, uh, the president-elect, and there's no substantial evidence that Governor Bush is not the uh, president-elect, given that he has 271 uh, pledged and certified electoral votes. Also, the administrator is clearly a primarily ministerial actor, under this act at least. It is simply absurd to think that Congress would define the uh, administrator's uh, obligations under this act as being, administeri as being ministerial in scope and then give gigantic discretion on the front end to determine when, or when he has to release the funds. It is simply, uh, in this sort of, in some extent, is related to what Professor Turley said, it is simply not a reasonable understanding of the statute to think that they meant for the, uh, uh, for the administer to have sort of a free-ranging portfolio to, uh, to make that sort of determination. I see I'm over time, but I might ask if I could have uh, leave for maybe a minute or two just to comment on some of the other arguments that have been made with respect to the law. First, I do agree that, um, uh, that regardless of whether or not uh, uh, Governor Bush is named the uh, uh, president-elect, uh, uh, Vice President Gore cannot be called that. I don't think there's any basis for that, which would respond to uh, Congressman Yossi's question about whether or not we can release funds to both. Uh, I checked, and in fact, uh, um, the, for the vice president in response to uh, your question, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, the, the time period does begin 30 days. It was amended in the 1988 version. There is an interesting colloquy in the legislative history that specifically talks about a, a question to Mr. Fischel was posed. What if we have a candidate who is three or four votes shy in the Electoral College? Uh, and uh, Congressman Fischel specifically replied, no, if they're basically three or four, if they don't have a majority in the Electoral College, there is no basis for considering such a candidate to be the, uh, um, um, the president-elect, the clear implication being that if they do have a majority that, uh, that it would be appropriate. Finally, on this, this isolated bit of uh, bits of legislative history that have been taken out of context, uh, I believe, with respect to what it means uh, with respect to a close election. First, um, I cited the uh, specific recognition that the 1960 election, where in fact we had a lot of litigation and other uh, recounts that threatened to upset the result, was not considered to be the sort of thing that interfered with the designation of an apparent uh, winner. Uh, more, most importantly, floor, it's a standard uh, uh, technique of statutory construction that floor statements, especially isolated floor statements taken out of context, cannot contradict the plain language and reasonable construction of the statute. And I think if you look at the full legislative history and historical context of this statute, um, I believe that the uh, administrator's reliance on those provisions that he relies on is simply unfounded. 
first is the reference uh, uh, as i said the question was posed what if we have a candidate who's three or four votes shy of having a majority the response was mr fischel's uh, response that the in that situation the administrator would have no discretion to release the funds the second one that is relied upon is the one on page uh, 13 348 the reference to uh, um, uh, a close election there if you read the question that was posed to that it had special historical significance which is the question that mr fischel was responding to is a question of mr gross which says we apparently have a situation growing up in certain states of the union whereby there may be independent electors that is a clear reference to the 1960 election in the act in the situations in the early 60s in the 1960 election a number of independent democratic electors were named who then voted for harry bird rather than john f kennedy for president it is clear that what he is talking about is electors who are not pledged or certified to any particular candidate but are running on a position that they uh, have independent discretion to vote their conscience. The idea being that then the southern states wanted to, could then use them to broker a deal with either the, the president of either party, throw their electors, whichever one they thought uh, would give them what they wanted on the obvious issues that were dividing the, uh, the country at that time. Clearly what this is, again, is a reference to a situation where you cannot predict that any candidate has a majority of electors. Both of those situations are references to situations where no candidate you can, has a majority of pledged or certified electors. So I think that that reference to those close elections is taken out of context, read in full context. It supports a reading that the administrator uh, um, is mistaken in this situation and that the plain language uh, and the policies of the statute further support that conclusion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, do any of the other members, and especially the administrator, have any thoughts about uh, Professor Zawacki's testimony? Does it uh, give you some new guidance, Mr. Administrator? <laughs> uh, no. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to, do you mean am I going to change at this moment what I have been, where I have been the last few days? No. I listened to him very carefully. And disagree with him on some issues, but and I don't think we want to get into that kind of a d discussion right now. He's a he's a law professor. I'm just a business guy. <laughs> Modesty does not fit. Okay, uh, I'll give you the same invitation I gave to Mr. Turley. If you want to get us some language in the next 24 hours, we'll be glad to have it. Okay, I think the statute's fine the way it's written. So. <laughs> Let me just say and do it. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me, I will make one comment if I can, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I don't know how important this is, but I do recall in, in 1960, I am old enough to remember that election, that Richard Nixon was saying well into the night, if present trends continue, you know, I'll, 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 you know, John Kennedy will win. And I believe he conceded the next morning or in the middle of the morning. He did. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fairly significant event. Uh, I think you're right on that one. Uh, I'm not aware of all those other cases they cited. They must have been state Republican parties because President Nixon's view was that uh, I do not intend to contend it, even though we knew Illinois, New Jersey, a few other states where there was major fraud. The Senate uh, Committee on Rules did send an investigator to Chicago and when they opened the ballot box, carefully labeled, you know, Kennedy 80, Nixon 2, and uh, there was no ballots at all in the box. So just the tally. And uh, I'll never forget that one. The Rules Committee of the Senate doesn't, isn't often to uh, uh, working on, on a lot of things, but this one was fascinating. So is that, uh, Mr. Ink, is that your recollection that he... Uh, my understanding is that litigation did continue pace, just as the Seminole County litigation in Florida is not being, uh, is not a Gore litigation situation. It's a, it's a state litigation brought by voters in Seminole County, but threatens to upset the election. My understanding is that there was several states uh, in which litigation did proceed apace and, hand, and recounts proceeded apace, uh, including Hawaii changing their designated electors, uh, but that, and that it was an extremely close election that those things did not in Congressman Fischel's judgment, upset the ease with which one could be designated, that uh, John F. Kennedy could be designated the apparent successful candidate in that election. 
Uh, Mr. Gerson, do you agree with uh, Mr. Zawicki's testimony? Um, in, in part, and in, in, in other parts, we, we might disagree a, a, a bit. I, I mean, Nixon did act in the way that you described, and the, uh, uh, and the uh, two contests that might have mattered, uh, Illinois and West Virginia, were withdrawn as a result of what uh, 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 Mr. Nixon uh, instructed his his lieutenants to do at the time, but I don't know that that detracts from the from the, from the main argument. Uh, I don't agree that the statute uh, is uh, uh, sufficient at this time for, for the reasons that we're all that we're all discussing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Professor Zawicki and I do agree uh, that uh, the the administrator shouldn't have unfettered discretion, uh, and we also agree that uh, uh, we believe he reached the wrong decision with the discretion that he has because uh, uh, appearance uh, is, is a conditional term. And uh, one can say, I believe correctly, that uh, uh, Governor Bush apparently has 271 pledged electors. Uh, I think that's a fair pricey of where uh, Professor Zawicki and I might agree and disagree. I think we probably agree on the more material aspects of, of his testimony. I certainly don't agree that this is the worst statute I've ever seen, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not my position. <laughs> uh, well, I thank, I thank you. We now go to the penultimate witness, Norman J. Ornstein, resident scholar, American Enterprise Institute for Policy Research. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I might note at the start that I've uh, spent most of the last couple of years and intend to spend the next several months uh, co-directing a transition to governing project uh, done with AEI Brookings and also in conjunction with the Hoover Institution. We've been geared up to facilitate a speedy transition and it's been a frustrating uh, process uh, to be sure. Uh, I think we have three basic questions uh, here today that we've had to deal with. Um, the first one, uh, which we've just had some lengthy discussion, uh, uh, and which we've just had some lengthy discussion, was the administrator appropriately exercising his ministerial function. I want to weigh in on that one also. Uh, then come uh, two very relevant questions. What can, we do, what can be done about this situation now, and what, if anything, can be done to improve the law for the future uh, that will extend beyond this election to the next ones? I come down on the side that uh, the administrator did appropriately exercise his uh, uh, ministerial function. I've read the history and read the language, uh, and I believe, uh, and I, here I take slight issue with, uh, which is unusual for me, with uh, my colleague Paul Light, too. Uh, I think that the uh, Congress was very concerned uh, with the notion of a political judgment being made by a non-political figure uh, at a delicate time. It was actually, a, I think, a, a something more in the minds of Republicans at the time, partly because you had Democrats running everything in 1963. Certainly it was H.R. Gross's uh, concern. The idea that by making a judgment when there was still a question, a serious question, a real question, that could provide some psychological or other advantages uh, to a candidate, inappropriately so. Now, as Paul said, uh, uh, Donnie Fussell, tried to draw a line, said it wasn't going to happen. It doesn't happen very often. It has happened before, clearly in three elections, 1800, 1824, and 1876. And the question we have today is uh, partly, if we're going to consider those uh, examples and that judgment and what Congress was talking about, is this election closer to 1800, 1824, 1876, or is it closer to, say, 1960? To me, there's no question that it's much closer to the former three than it is to the latter, partly because, as we've just said, uh, you had a concession, you did not have a candidate pursuing uh, uh, challenges, and if those challenges had been pursued, it is true that this was a, 1960 was a close election in popular vote terms, but where it matters in electoral votes, it was not one state, it was several states. It would have required a parlay of several states, and we know from our history that Richard Nixon considered whether or not he would uh, carry out a challenge for a variety of reasons, some pragmatic, uh, some uh, ideological, uh, some uh, related to his basic sense that it would be bad for the country. He decided not to. The patriotic reasons were a part of it as well. It would have required a number of challenges with very iffy outcomes. What we have here is an election in which, at the moment, we have one candidate with 271 apparent electoral votes, the other with 267, but with 25 of those electoral votes hanging in the balance 
of between 1 50th and 1 100th of 1% of the votes in a state with challenges going forward. That is not comparable, I think, to 1960. By all of the commentary we have around us, uh, it, it uh, certainly has its parallels in the past, although it's also unique. So I think he acted uh, in a reasonable fashion, even if we might have acted differently or if uh, he had a discretionary authority to act differently. Whether it should be handled differently uh, in the future, I can't for the life of me see why turning this over to the Attorney General is better than turning it over to the Administrator of the General Services Administration when the whole point of this was to make a judgment not about who the President was, but about when you begin a transition process. It seems to me it's, a, it's an appropriate place in which to go. Now, what do we do about this situation in the more practical vein? And I would urge you to take one action, and that is this. We now have, I think, a strong desire in the country and in Washington to move in a bipartisan direction however we go. I would urge Mr. Horn and Mr. Turner, when this hearing ends, to call up uh, Speaker Hastert, uh, Minority Leader Gephardt, and also Majority Leader Lott and Minority Leader Daschle. With Congress around and people here this week, it seems to me that you can get an easy amendment to this act, or ought to be able to, uh, within a day or two. And I would guess you would have the President willing and eager to sign it, that allocates these funds immediately to two candidates. Do it now, give them space. Hey, that, that's why we've given the 24 hours. Yes, bit. yeah. And I think we can act more swiftly than Congress usually acts now because it seems to me there is an overwhelming consensus that that ought to be done now and into the future, that it is in the nation's interest to begin a transition early. Now, let me just very quickly address uh, a couple of issues, and I won't go long. I've done it before in front of the committee and I've, uh, the subcommittee, and I hope we can do it again. I hope after this is over, or even during the remaining weeks uh, of this session in preparation for next time, you will take an even broader look at uh, this act. You did some very commendable things uh, in the last Congress, uh, and uh, I think they're going to have a, a strong positive impact. But I believe we ought to be uh, encouraging a climate in which transitions begin before the election, in which we not only encourage but almost mandate the candidates to begin a transition process before the election is over, to begin a formal transition process. Right now and through this contest, despite a lot of what we hope to get out there in the dialogue in the country, it's still considered presumptuous to talk about or to act or to move in different ways before the election is over. We should start that process and then make sure it, it can continue. I would also urge you to uh, look at the possibility of uh, codifying uh, a, an action that uh, Attorney General Reno very commendably uh, took, uh, or at least announced that she would take uh, just a couple of days ago. And that is to make sure that the FBI field investigations of prospective nominees take place, begin before those nominations are formally made. It seems to me that there is an easy way to do this, that if a president-elect or uh, even in a situation like this uh, where there may be even the slightest question, puts forward a list of potential nominees with the approval of those people, you don't want investigations going on for uh, the, the wrong reasons, that the FBI should uh, know clearly in advance that it can begin that process so that we can minimize the delays going forward. I would hope what would flow from that as well is that we will do a full-scale investigation of all the impediments in place to get presidential appoint, uh, appointees into those offices as early as possible. We have a lot of suggestions out there on the table, some of which go back a few years to the uh, 20th Century Funds uh, Task Force, some of which I and my colleagues have made. And uh, you could do no greater service, I think, to the country than to uh, move on those as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I ask uh, the gentleman from Texas, the ranking member, Mr. Turner, if he has some questions of the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Ornstein, obviously from uh, being here and hearing my remarks, you know that I concur with you with regard to your analysis regarding the authority of the administrator and what the statute directs him to do or not to do. Uh, the one thing that did uh, pique my interest uh, about your suggestions for the future, um, and I might say I, I certainly concur that we certainly could amend the statute immediately, be able to fund both candidates 
in transition under these types of circumstances and should do so. But you suggested that we go further and provide some transitional funding for candidates prior to the November election day. Yes. And I'm not sure I understand why you think that is as critical or appropriate as funding the uh, successful candidates or the candidates, both of whom may be successful, uh, after election day. Well, uh, just uh, briefly, Mr. Turner, I think what happens now is that uh, for all kinds of reasons, presidential candidates don't want to take the time or feel it's inappropriate to talk about or to plan other than surreptitiously a transition in advance. Now, we did have the candidates pick transition directors. They tried to uh, uh, operate below the radar screen. What ends up happening is a president-elect uh, often doesn't really start thinking about this process until the day after the election or sometimes later, at, the, at a point at which he's entirely exhausted uh, when uh, there's no other strong incentive to really move uh, rapidly. A lot of things could be in place earlier. And not only that, I think it's good and important for the country to recognize that a transition is a meaningful uh, exercise. It isn't just something we watch idly as we see a new person begin to ease into the presidency, but it involves serious, tangible steps for governing. We need to focus more on governing during the campaign. Candidates should focus more on governing. And uh, it's useful to find ways structurally to build that into the process. Uh, and I think given what we know, given that the last couple of presidencies, uh, the number of uh, months that it takes just to get the Senate confirmable appointees in place when you start just the day after the election, uh, we need to cut that back. And if we can begin to uh, hit the ground running even before the election, it wouldn't hurt. May, may I dissent slightly from something that uh, Mr. Ornstein just said? I, I I think that this committee will be will be able to come up with suitable language that deals with the situation post-election that we have today. And, and as I have, I, I reiterate that I, I urge the committee, to, the subcommittee, to do so. But I think you run into great danger if you extend that sort of license to a time before the election. We've had third parties in the last two elections that have had a meaningful effect on the outcome. And I, I hesitate to want to ever be involved in the kind of litigation that one would face as to, as to pre-election funding of, su of such an operation, uh, especially when, when some uh, third-party candidate uh, might allege that uh, his or her uh, uh, campaign is the linchpin to future policy. And from a, from a theoretical uh, uh, standpoint, uh, I, I think it would be unwise for the legislative process in terms of funding to supplant what the parties properly should do in advance of the election in defining the direction of, 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 their, of their candidate or the candidate in defining the direction of the party. And so while I think Mr. Ornstein's suggestion is laudable from election day on where we have a suitably close race that one can say rationally uh, that uh, uh, there is at least a potentiality for uh, alternative candidates ultimately to become president, I wouldn't go beyond it. Yes, Mr. Light. Well, I, I'd say that uh, back in 1988, we did have provisions in the Presidential mm -hmm. Transition Effectiveness Act for doing exactly what Norm was suggesting. We had um, uh, the United States Senate passed a bill that, uh, as part of the uh, act, that would have given the major party committees, as defined under the Federal Election Campaign mm -hmm. Act, $250,000 each to do some pre-election transition planning, uh, sort of personnel kinds of things, inventories of positions. And um, it, it happened at a table here in conference where we just had a problem dealing with the amount of money that would be wasted. And it was dropped because uh, there were some uh, uh, members of the conference committee who just felt it was a waste of money to give a losing candidate $250,000 for pre-election planning. And uh, to this day, I think it, uh, it was a mistake and no disrespect intended to the uh, giant uh, in the portrait uh, above your shoulder. <laughs> um, I, I think it would have been a good investment, and the, the parties would have continued that activity after the election and would have built the capacity, a small investment uh, that might have yielded a big result. And um, I guess I'd say on, on this side that, that we came close, but uh, no cigar, uh, no disrespect <laughs> again. Well, I want to get, uh, I wanna get uh, Dwight Inc. into this. Uh, I was just really looking at the lawyer questions to try to wind that one up and wind it up. But uh, Mr. Inc. has, I think, served seven presidents. He's 
testified before Congress over 50 years, and he has been acting GSA administrator. And so, twice. Uh, <laughs> twice. once, yes. Twice. twice. Or twice. Uh, and I'd like to get him some of his thoughts in, particularly if they relate to the legal drafting here and what you think, who should do it? Should the Comptroller General do it or whoever? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, having had that experience that you talked about, I, I feel very strongly that a transition has much to do with the success or failure of a pres new presidency, particularly in the first year, uh, sometimes throughout uh, a whole presidential term. And we saw, of course, what happened to the Kennedy uh, transition in the national security area where that vacuum uh, directly led to the Bay of Pigs and then later to the Cuban uh, nuclear missile crisis. But there are many other things that are much less dramatic that have a considerable impact on the success or failure of a presidency. Uh, without going into the details, my own view is that the flavor of much of the hearing today considerably understates the importance of the transition and considerably understates the problems that we're are already accumulating in this particular transition. Uh, Mr. Sununu talked about some of them. The, the, the new budget people are going to have to start virtually from scratch to pull together a new budget, and you, can't, you cannot do that scattered around in law offices around town. You cannot do it. It's almost impossible to do it if, under the very best of circumstances. Policies and new initiatives have to be developed in such a way that they're workable. We saw the problem of President Clinton's health care plan in which the workability dimension uh, was not addressed uh, during the early period. So there are a whole series of things that need to, uh, attention and we're already behind schedule and much of the perception today, which I agree with, nevertheless was from the perspective of White House people and the outside media, not from the perspective of the agencies and the departments where the impact of these delays uh, is, can be very, very serious, and I think we're already seriously behind schedule. I agree that, um, by the way, that I think the GSA staff, Jane, uh, June Huber, I think has done very well, and uh, I think that uh, uh, they are, have tried very hard within the framework of the law as they have had it interpreted for them. With respect to the law, I think one can make, as has been done here, a legal argument that funds could have been released or could now be released by the General Service Administration. I think there's a very strong counter argument to that. But what I think we need to keep in mind is the public policy dimension. To what extent will the public, general public, accept the notion that an agency head, the head of GSA, has determined their next president. My own view is that that is wishful thinking. I do not think it, in a political, public policy sense it would be accepted. I think we have to have uh, some legislative action. I think we need to amend Presidential Transition Act. With the litigation that's been spawned in this election, that is likely going to create, I think, much more litigation in the future than we've had in the past. I have one possible uh, suggestion, and probably are better ones. But in my testimony, I suggest as one example that if five or ten days, whichever you want, after the election, no candidate had clearly won. GSA should then make available the assistance now authorized under the law on an equal basis to each candidate until a clear winner is determined by such means as a concession or the legal processes have run their course. Admittedly, the amount received by the eventual winner would be reduced or, not what I would prefer, is that supplemental funds would be uh, made available but held in reserve 
for such an eventuality. So that's one suggestion I would suggest that the committee take under consideration in the next 48 hours. I think um, uh, without waiting to see how that happens, I believe that uh, uh, the, this committee should move forward as Mr. Ornstein uh, has suggested. I think to look at much broader than just this provision I've talked about, which is something I would suggest be done immediately and see what else can be done. And I do support the, the thoughts of Paul Light and Norm Ornstein on uh, developing some way to have some advance funding, even in advance of the election. Uh, Mr. Chairman, beyond the transition legislation, however, I think we need to also look at the need for reform of election laws and regulations. This current situation is weakening the confidence of the public in our election process and it is exposing the United States to ridicule around the world. I suggest a bipartisan commission to look at opportunities for removing the types of election problems we're now experiencing. Perhaps a commission co-chaired by former presidents Ford and Carter with a composition drawn heavily from former state and local officials. Now, I'm not suggesting that this commission review the electoral college concept because I think that gets us too quickly into partisan issues that would overshadow everything else. And I do not suggest that a commission should attempt to set standards for state. But I think it could bring state and local groups together to examine the election problems, compare approaches that they found uh, useful, and consider reforms that states might find useful. And it might even uh, spawn uh, some state commissions, such as the Hoover commissions did in spawning little Hoover commissions uh, uh, in the 1950s. So, Mr. Chairman, as to summarize, I think the transition problem is not, not a national crisis, but I think it's much more serious than much of what has been described here today. And I do recommend specific legislation, specific amendments for the Presidential Transition Act, and I, represent, and I uh, recommend a bipartisan commission on looking at our election laws. Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, um, Mr. Barry. For what it's worth, and I, speaking uh, not as a, you know, I haven't cleared this with the White House, but I, I endorse uh, Dwight Ink's notion of a of within 10 days, uh, and I think there ought to be a supplemental budget uh, available. Um, I think that would be just fine. We would have to figure out how to find additional space rather than split it in half, but that's a small price to pay for the kind of transition that we ought to have. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Zawicki. If I, I'll, if I may just have one brief comment, which is it, it, it strikes me again, my view is that the administrator's discretion is virtually nil under the statute that's triggered by the Electoral College account. But uh, if you disagree with that, it seems like there's really two directions you have to go. One is either to provide for some sort of expedited judicial review or some sort of administrative review of the standards that the administrator uh, is using uh, if he's going to, if we're going to interpret this such that it gives him discretion, um, I don't, I, you've got to have some mechanism for, for reviewing that. Alternatively, you got, uh, you, alternatively, you can clarify the language to make, to, to rem make it clearer to remove the discretion and create more of a bright line rule, which is what I'm proposing that the statute already creates is a bright line rule that relieves the administrator of most of his discretion. But it seems like the current situation of unreviewable discretion uh, on no articulated basis seems to me the worst to be the worst of all worlds. Mr. Well, I'd like you in this discussion here, what authority, <coughs> what uh, individual or holder of a position in the executive branch should be asked to do that? Any thoughts other than the GSA administrator? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily have any problems with the GSA administrator 
doing it in a way such that it triggers, say, the APA protections and is subject to judicial review. So you could have a situation where you clarify he has discretion to make this call, but then say that it's a state that's a factual interpretation that uh, uh, is subject to judicial review under the standard sorts of mechanisms that we review review. Uh, 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 discretionary judgments by administrative agents. And that seems like it could be done on a relatively uh, uh, expedited basis in, in the federal courts. Yeah, Mr. Gerson. I would respectfully disagree with that. I think your questioning, Mr. Horn, implies a much better way to deal with this. Um, there's no problem uh, in, in the abstract with the, with the administrator of GSA exercising some level of, of supervision. But the idea, and even though I talk about APA uh, compliance is, as, as one way to look at, at reviewability if we're in exactly the same situation we're in now, which, which, is, which is one thing. We want to diminish the number of cases like this that go to court. We do not want the That's judiciary right. serving as, as, as the archons for, for decisions that belong in the body politic or in the legislature. Uh, so I think that that's not a good idea. The much better idea, the one that you described, uh, is either to tone up the, uh, uh, the, the definition of, of appearance in the, in the statute, or better than that, deal on a prospective basis in the way that you're just describing that I think everybody would, would like to see you act, that, that when you have a race of, such, of, of sufficient closeness, which ought to be defined to eliminate fringe candidates from, the, from this discussion altogether, uh, that, if, that if somebody's within 10 percent of the number of electoral votes that you need, or whatever, whatever, whatever it might be, that uh, the administrator is authorized to, to fund those candidates subject to the, the sorts of considerations that you're describing now. That's a way that the problem can be worked out in, a, in an intelligent political uh, sense without burdening the courts or imposing an imperial judiciary on a, on a process where it doesn't belong at all. This, this idea that we keep hearing that uh, these challenges to the, to the election are all put within the rights of the candidates, true enough, and so this is a great thing. It's not a great thing. Let, let me ask you all about the 271 electoral votes, and are they real? They aren't, haven't been cast yet, and there's always some nervousness where somebody might uh, go it. And I'm told the uh, opposition to the governor I have been making phone calls all over America trying to get electoral votes to change. So would that be, uh, and how would you define it if those electors one or two weeks earlier uh, note a majority? And at that point, could the GSA administrator make a decision or not? Well, well is it on this topic, or have you got a substitute? No, it's, uh, it's, it's, okay. it's on that topic. I, uh, I, it seems to me that you can't set uh, a specific set of uh, criteria that will govern all the time. Uh, if you look at 1800, 1824, 1876, the classic examples, this one's different. The next one's going to be different than these. What you could do is lay out some of the criteria you'd want to use, and it would seem to me the absence of a concession an election where one state or uh, perhaps two are within a small margin of error where the electoral votes themselves would change the outcome and there are legal processes in place being pursued by the candidate who's behind uh, are, are, are certainly reasonable criteria. But one should note, Mr. Chairman, that just imagine if the circumstances between the two candidates today were reversed. Imagine if uh, Vice President Gore had 271 electoral votes to 267 at the moment for uh, Governor Bush. Imagine that it came down to Florida with a margin of one one hundredth of one percent and legal processes were going on. And a GSA administrator of the same party as the Vice President yeah. preempted the process early and said, I'm going to declare that uh, the vice president is a president-elect. We would have had a firestorm of controversy. That, it seems to me, is just what H.R. Uh, Gross, among others, wanted to avoid. And, you know, if you consider that context, you can find a way to inject yourself into the political process. We didn't consider it this time because you had the opposite political parties. But boy, as we've seen in, uh, in other places in the country, you can have people in the same party and it, co it creates a cloud. But, I mean, I think the, the issue about what H.R. Gross intended in his debate has, has to be measured about what Dante Fassell and the authors of the statute in Congress eventually concluded in the statute, which was 
They did not wish to wait for absolute certainty here. They wanted to start the transition. I'm very comfortable with the administrator of GSA retaining the discretion to make the apparency decision. If he can't make it within a date certain, then let him begin parallel transitions. Then the big debate, and one that I'm, I'm sure this administrator do doesn't want to engage, is whether you're going to put one at 1800 G Street and the other down at the Navy Yard and what that pitched battle is going to be for the best space. But I mean, the administrator does have the um, ability to make these decisions. You shouldn't put the criteria into statute. Uh, put the criteria as a such as into your legislative report and just create a trigger so that the administrator can continue to use his discretion. Can I, can I? May, may I say on, on that last point, we face the problem in the federal courts of they don't care anything about reports, about collo uh, colloquies on the floor or anything. It has to either be in the law or don't expect it to be administered. But if you get too detailed, you lock yourself into a set of, uh, of criteria. I'm, there, there was some discussion here today about who is the GSA administrator after all. Well, we, we can see him, and it, uh, it, it's a, a unit of government that has a, a strong record and has been uh, an agency that uh, has had good, strong leadership. And we can allow that administrator to have the discretion within appropriate bounds, I think. Yeah. Mr. Uh, let me ask. Uh, yeah, on, on, that, on that point, on that. I think it is crystal clear from the, at least the legislative history, if not the statute, but that they clearly understood that a majority of electoral votes was going to be the trigger here, because that is all they talk about, is the scenario where if somebody has is three or four votes shy uh, in the Electoral College, they cannot be the president-elect. They clearly contemplated that some of the electoral votes might have the possibility to change after an apparent winner was named, and that simply did not deter them uh, in that situation. They could, that seems to me to be, at least it is originally constructed, a majority of the electoral votes is the trigger. And I want to second something that uh, uh, Mr. Gerson said, which is I am not calling for judicial review. I think that the, the best situation is to create some sort of bright line rule uh, with respect to this, because Although I'm sure uh, uh, Mr. Barham is uh, uh, doing his, his, his best, it's uh, in a difficult situation. I simply don't think that there's any reason to believe that when they wrote this legislation that they expected that the, uh, that the administrator was going to wield this kind of discretion. It is clear that they thought it was going to be a bright line rule, an easy determined outcome based on electoral votes, and that you're not going to have sort of this open-ended kind of inquiry, or they would have provided for some sort of uh, review of, uh, of discretion if they'd intended to uh, create that sort of open-ended inquiry. Mr. Uh, Mr. Barham. I Mr. Think. Chairman, I... I um I don't have any doubt in my mind that in the year 2004, uh, we will know how to count votes electronically for technology so we don't have this stuff going on that's going on today. Uh, and I think that if I may suggest to this committee, I think the most valuable thing for you to do is figure out how to get a supplemental appropriation or some way where both campaigns can begin to spend government money on the transition activities. That would be profitable because I believe that you can walk into, you could have a poll. Uh, every, every precinct in America could have uh, a piece of technology where you made your choices and a screen flashed up and said, is this what you meant? You could push a button and now it's recorded. The, only, the, the most significant problem we would have is making sure that none of that got out to 11 p.m. in the East. Uh, but the the, the machine count would be, it would be very hard to ever say, well, I didn't mean it when I pushed the button, yes. And we all, the younger generation grown up using video games would find this particularly sensible. If we did it at every precinct, it would be easy for me to imagine people cleverly figuring out how you could do that over the internet with the right kind of encryption, absentee ballots. You could even walk into the polling booth with that little card that we've all seen a million times on television, punched stick it into this device and up would pop, here's what you voted for, is that what you meant, Mr. So-and-so? You push a button, yes, and you're done. If, we, if that were the case, so I think the, the solution to this is going to be much more technological and a better voting mechanism than it is to not, to not be disrespectful about it, but how many angels can dance on the head of a pin conversation that we can easily get into. Uh, 
the quick gentleman take from Texas, Mr. Turner, on questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to ask maybe if we could get a, your thoughts on one proposal here that see if we could reach consensus. Obviously, if we're going to remedy this legislatively in the near term, we've got to have something pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Everybody understands, everybody agrees and signs off on. And, and I think Mr. Light and I know Mr. Ornstein uh, shared that view that we don't want to put the administrator of GSA in the position of appearing even, either actually or appearing to pick the president. Um, and this suggestion, Mr. Zwicky, about trying to have a, that this current law is a bright line, I, I don't view it as a bright line other than to say, as I think the legislative history would support, the, uh, Mr. Fussell was simply saying, if you don't know, if an intelligent being can't really tell, you do nothing. Almost as if to say, this is not any entitlement, this is federal dollars we're talking about here, and if you can't figure it out, well, you just don't do anything, which is exactly what's happened in the instance case. So maybe, and let me ask each of you to respond to this, maybe we could leave the language alone regarding apparent, the apparent winner, the apparent uh, victor, because as uh, I read from the dictionary you handed us, apparent, one definition is uh, of apparent is, as a synonym, it is evident, obvious, or patent. Uh, capable of easily being perceived or understood, plain, clear, or obvious. And perhaps we could leave the statutory language regarding apparent alone for the moment and simply say that if it's not a determined within 10 days, then the two candidates at the top will divide the money. That means we don't disturb the discretion that's there for the GSA administrator to simply decide but if he doesn't, for whatever reason, uh, then he's not in the position of actively choosing one over the other or even choosing that there's not a winner. It simply says his failure to act within 10 days will result in the division of the funds to the top two candidates. Now, I'd like each of you to respond to that. Mr. Ng? Well, I, of course, in principle, I think that's a great idea. I'm glad you suggested it <laughs> uh, because I think it gets the administrator out of the role, the, in so far as the public is concerned, the apparent role of having chosen a U.S. president, which is absolutely a, the wrong role for the administrator of GSA to, to play. Uh, whether you use the word apparent or clear, I, I use the word clear, I don't have a strong view on that, uh, and, uh, uh, but the concept I, I strongly support. I think, I think rely, relying upon uh, judicial remedies is the wrong road to go. You've got to minimize as much as you can the uncertainty. You have to minimize as much as is possible uh, the, the role of the courts in trying to do, uh, uh, determine when funds are going to be available for the transition. I'd only have one uh, concern, Mr. Turner. I, I, I think congenitally I look at uh, unintended consequences when I think about any of these changes, and I, you just need to think a little bit about that in terms of making sure you don't provide any incentive for a candidate who's not in a position to win to avoid a concession to get a bundle of money uh, to keep going for a period of time. Uh, so you still need to have a process here where uh, you, you move towards declaring a winner, except under extraordinary circumstances. I don't think you can specify all of those circumstances. Uh, I think that Mr. Barham is right. We're going to move to a very different voting system. And the electronic aspect of it, the touchscreen aspect of it, will take away some of these problems. But I will also tell you, we're moving very rapidly towards vote by mail, vote by internet, people not voting in the polling places. And that is going to bring us back to a kind of corruption uh, that we had before we had the Australian ballot and the secret uh, ballot in the voting booth in 1884, after 1884, where we'll have other kinds of problems that will emerge. We can't tell them all. We can probably establish some guidelines, but I think you need to have some discretion here uh, for uh, an individual uh, to make some of those determinations. I, I, t I take it that uh, on this suggestion, which I'm not opposed to it, on the just divided between the two. If that was a president already in office, uh, he would not, 
he or she would not get any of that to money. Yes. Because I think H.R. Gross would say in that colloquy, <laughs> be boy, that will really be some pizza party. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's how he point. used to deal with this. That's a good point, Mr. I'll just, uh, my view, I don't, uh, I, I think it, it, it raises a good idea, one that probably needs more study more than, than we have the leisure now. One easy fix to the current situation would be to amend Section 4C of the, uh, that was enacted in 1988 that gives us 30-day reachback period for the Vice President and simply amend that, I presumably could do it retroactively to say that it that, that trigger for the outgoing administration begins the day of the election, uh, so that you could open that window and just release the money that Vice President uh, Gore would be entitled to uh, 30 days before the end of the, the term and just open it up. I don't see any reason why 30 days is a better rule than election day anyway, so that might be one easy way of uh, uh, just a, a very small tweak could resolve the, uh, the issue that, we, that, you, that is currently going on. I think you'd want to make sure that you prorate the expenditures so that you don't end up in a situation where you've spent all the money by about December 18th. Um, so you, you have to amend the statute to give the administrator uh, discretion to make sure that the expenditures are reasonable and that you're, you, you're not outspending the monies available. That, uh, and I think when, you could do that very easily in statute. You'll have near certainty with, uh, with December 18th or, uh, I mean, you have absolute certainty on January 20th, so you just have to roll back and, and make sure the money isn't gone. Any other comments on this? Uh, Mr. Rank. Uh, I, my, my preference, if we were to go this route, though, would be to do it in such a way that the uh, winner was not handicapped, not having the amount of funds reduced. I think by having a supplemental amount that would be held in reserve for such an eventuality would be a very small price to pay for the ability, opening up the ability to move forward with a full-fledged transition. Uh, let, me, let me also suggest that in your, your drafting process that you make as a condition of accepting these funds in this uh, sort of dual transition period, um, full disclosure of any private funds being raised. I mean, that would just basically pull forward the requirements under the current 1988 amendments. I think that is current law, is it not? Yeah, but I mean, right now, uh, the uh, Bush and Cheney transition have voluntarily agreed to uh, abide by the disclosure requirements, but uh, you, you just need to... Uh, I think the law requires... The law would take, the law would take care of it. The reason, the reason why uh, the Bush-Cheney uh, uh, group is where it is is because it's not getting the, the right. funds in the transition. If it right. were the disclosure provision would be triggered. Right. So that I think that if you make those funds avail available and you continue what you have right. in 1988, right. it's a non that's a non-problem. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would urge you to do this now in the simplest and most neutral yes. way possible for now. Then you can go back when you have more leisure uh, and think about whether the, the language that you've used would be appropriate without unintended consequences for future elections. I agree with that. But did, did I understand all of you to agree the basic concept of having the administrator exercise his discretion within the first 10 days, if he fails to so exercise, then the funds shall be divided equally between uh, the two top candidates and subject to the refinements you mentioned, such as ensuring that uh, the funds are they're accountable for the funds and that they don't spend it all at one time. And I assume that as, at such time as the apparent winner is determinable, then the funds would cease to the losing candidate. Would that be an appropriate right. yes. refinement correct. as well? Okay. I, I, would just, I think Mr. Ornstein made a very important point, though, and I, I want to subscribe to that particularly, which is, uh, don't legislate for all times today and tomorrow. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's a bad way to, 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 to cook a meal. Yeah. Uh, solve this problem. You have great consensus and very easy resolution. If you get into uh, legislating for all time, you're not going to be able to push this thing through the short window that you have. Uh, um, I think Mr. Ornstein and I, as, as this discussion has, has progressed, are, are, are fairly close together on what you ought to do ultimately. There needs to be, to the extent that discretion uh, resides in the in the administrator or somebody else. There still need to be some defining uh, circumstances as to how he or she might exercise it. I think it ought to be pegged to to the electoral vote or the probable electoral vote more than anything else, given mm -hmm. the nation's history and the way the Constitution works. But uh, 
Uh, that aside, uh, I think you ought to solve the immediate problem now and then in a, in a more considered way deal with the, with the ultimate solution to how that discretion might be exercised. Well, while you're, while you're um, solving the immediate problem, I would really urge you to seriously consider doubling the money or making more money available especially now if we're going to if we're going to if you, if you come up with a solution where we end up having both campaigns with uh money we're going to it's going to cost a little more than if we had four months to prepare for it so i just want you to, to know that so that we don't shortchange either either group okay. you could just take one of the take a submarine out of the one of the uh, <laughs> uh, uh things that have been passed in the last year not out of connecticut <laughs> any other questions <laughs> Let me uh, thank the staff that uh, put this rapidly uh, together. Uh, Jay Russell George on my left, your right is staff director and chief counsel of the committee. Randy Kaplan, counsel. Bonnie Heald, director of communications. Earl Pierce, professional staff in back there. Elizabeth Sung, clerk. Rachel Reddick, intern, minority staff, Trey Henderson is counsel, and Jean Gosa is the minority clerk. The uh, overworked court reporters are Colleen Lynch and Melinda Walker, and we thank you both. And uh, I believe, Mr. Barham, in uh, the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States, I uh, would uh, urge you to look at the request from Congressman Clo Colby, the appropriator, and uh, myself as chairman of the authorizers last week, and I hope that there would be some ascertainment as quickly, quickly as possible as to who the apparent race of this presidential race is. And uh, I would hope in the next few days uh, that we would have some language that might solve the problem, but you can also stop the language if you take a look at what the Supreme Court's decision is today. I think you'd find nothing is going to happen uh, uh, until uh, that uh, decision is taken a look at. And I would hope you you and your staff would uh, go there and uh, see if you can't change your mind on a lot of this, because time, as one was said, is going along, and money isn't. Thank you. And we are now in adjournment. Yeah, sure. Well, I didn't see it. Good hearing. Okay. Hey, thanks. Yeah, we you get some language. Go find you on everything. So we'll get you some stuff. Yeah. I'm going to push you to work. Here's what's on C-SPAN 2 over the next few hours.